What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Broly, The Scion of Legend, Part 7. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. After getting rid of the chains, Broly shot a few key blasts at an empty space in the air far in the distance. The key blasts seemed to have disappeared, and after a moment a smoking figure shot out of that place. He had crossed his arms in front of him. It seemed like that person had blocked Broly's attack. Around his arms and torso wriggled a chain as if it was alive. He had an unnaturally squared face and long gray hair. His black skin had a metal-like shine to it. After being revealed, he didn't say anything. His figure began to blur again and was about to vanish. Broly didn't wait for him to finish though and directly closed in on him. Broly changed his direction suddenly and headed a few meters besides the figure. Broly grabbed out empty air. He pulled his hand back with his fists clenched as if he was holding on to something. With his other hand, he pierced just below his other hand. His hand made contact with something as it sounded out like Broly struck metal. The next moment, something crashed into the ground. Broly's one hand had some torn off gray hair, and the fingertips of his other hand were covered in blackish stains. The chain man dashed out of the smoke on the ground and revealed a large wound on his shoulder. It was bleeding black. He pressed his hand on the wound and tried to suppress the bleeding. Unfortunately for him, Broly hadn't stopped at all. As the chain man was still reorganizing himself, Broly had already arrived in front of him. Broly slammed into him with his green glowing chest. As soon as they made contact, a key blast on Broly's chest blasted the chain man through multiple buildings. The chain man pushed aside some debris that were lying on top of him. He suddenly stopped as he looked to the front, seeing Broly slowly walking out of the smoke caused by the explosion. His hair grew to his lower back and lightning circuited around his body. The chain man felt the pressure coming out of Broly. His chains were vibrating and pulling him slightly away. Broly. Suddenly he lost sight of Broly. He looked around frantically before feeling a sharp pain coming from his back. He tried to turn around, but he couldn't. Clinking from bits of chains falling onto the ground could be heard. The chain man looked down and saw a gaping hole right through his chest. He wanted to say something, but he couldn't muster up the strength. His agony didn't stop there. He felt like someone was drilling into his brain. Fortunately for him, the drilling pain grew more distant as time passed. His disturbed mind was slowly getting blurrier until he completely drifted off into nothingness and died. Broly held up the chain man by his head with one arm. He had disposed of what he thought of as the most dangerous of them on this battleground in only a few exchanges. He glanced to the side and threw the corpse of the chain man into the sky. Suddenly a blur appeared and collided with the corpse. The two bodies crashed into the ground. Broly vanished from his spot and was next seen, hovering over the smoke screen created by the crash landing of the two bodies. Broly knew that the one that crashed with the corpse was the one Aze and Taro had fought just a minute ago, but now each of them were fighting someone else. Kana and Zongya were still fighting the mech and Aaliyah found a strong opponent as well. His senses had already covered the whole battlefield long ago, and he knew that every one of Exaugia's top fighters were currently engaging an opponent. Fortunately, all of them were somewhat on the same level. The only one that had some troubles was Daz as he just advanced to a Super Scion not long ago and his opponent was nothing to scoff at, but as a veteran he held his own very well. Even the normal Scions were engaging people in uniform that indicated their relationship with that assassin organization. He instantly recognized the uniforms because the assassins in Reap's home wore the same outfit with a star on their chest. Only the stronger ones were wearing whatever they wanted. Broly looked down on the cloaked figure and saw a woman with big green eyes, tender pink skin, and some antennas on her head. She looked nothing like a cold-blooded assassin, but like a vulnerable loving creature, which was probably why she cloaked herself in this kind of open battle. If news got out about her appearance, she wouldn't easily fool someone in the future. She stood up and shot into the air right towards Broly. Her hands were covered with glittering powder. As she relentlessly struck at Broly, some of the powder was thrown into the air, reflecting the sunlight, 
which gave Broly a feeling that he was watching a beautiful dance. Even her screams that were melodious matched the whole picture of her dance. It would have been a perfect, beautiful performance if it weren't for the screams and explosions in the background. Or did that make it even better? Broly asked himself. After Broly was enjoying the dance for a while, he started pondering about the reason for this attack. It didn't make much sense why assassins would attack so blatantly. By doing so they lost their advantage of attacking from the shadows. They even brought so much personnel to wage a war on Exauge's ground. Although they had formidable strength as assassins, the Scions still had the upper hand as they were a warrior race. The normal assassins stood not much chance in an open battle against the Scions and the battle-hardened elves. From what he could tell out of the memories of the Chainman, they were ordered to eradicate everyone on Exausia, but the ones ordering should be at least aware of Broly's strength, right? If they really wanted to get rid of them all, they should have sent more or stronger people. Are they stalling me? Broly mumbled. Broly also thought about them trying to scout their overall strength, but Broly had already gathered some knowledge about their strength from the memories. They only had some left that were on the level of Reap and Co. That chain man was actually one of them as well. He was able to place his body into another dimension and attack with his chains from there. It would be nearly impossible to attack him if one didn't know where he entered. His entrance point was the same as his exit point. He also couldn't move around in that dimension but only guide his chains to move through and exit it. He only needed to enter his dimension out of sight of his enemies, and he would be practically impossible to be beat. Of course, the range of his chains were limiting but for that he had some other measures just in case. He had a cloning ability to mask his entry point in case he was accidentally found out or needed to close in on his target. Of course, this all was just a joke in front of Broly's vision. It was the same with Reap's ability. He was able to notice disturbance in space and act accordingly. Ko's illusions were also easily seen through by Broly. He could be said to be the nemesis of all assassins that rely on fooling their victim senses. The other top assassins in that organization had similar mysterious abilities. There is also the number one assassin of them. From the memories, he knew only about some myths about what his abilities might be, but nothing concrete. He never made a public appearance or stepped in to manage the assassins, but everyone knew that he was the backbone of the organization. Maybe they are scouting my abilities? Figuring out if they could handle me? If that is the case, what are they going to do now after knowing I could easily see through their abilities? As soon as Broly asked himself this, he stopped pondering about it. It didn't help to ponder about it anymore. He knew what he needed to do. He needed to attack them as soon as possible. If they really go into hiding, he didn't know when he would be able to find them. At least now he had an idea where their headquarters is. Either way, he needed to clean up here first and then head there. Broly focused back on the woman, but instead of her energetic and beautiful dance, he saw a stranger's body lying in front of him. He turned his head and saw the woman. He had fought just a moment ago. Her head was smashed in, and her whole body was a bloody mess. Broly looked at his fists that were covered with different colored blood. Pink seemed to be the lowest layer on his fists. It seemed like he had unconsciously beaten her to death. He looked to the side and not far away he saw a five meter tall black mech in pieces and with its torn off sword arm piercing through its cockpit. Red blood was flowing out along the blade. He looked around and saw a few more butchered bodies scattered on the ground. Broly then looked at the far away Aaliyah and the rest who were commanding the others to help the injured, which confirmed his suspicion. Lost in thought, Broly had stolen the kills of the other Scions. The turmoil caused by the attack was slowly quieting down as the higher-ups of Exausia were giving the citizens a purpose which was to help others. With a goal in mind, the crowd was exceedingly productive. Broly approached Aze to ask about the situation. Aze answered him that there were actually no casualties. Broly had questioned him about that, as it was strange that no one was killed. Aze only answered that the assassins were immediately noticed after they entered their orbit. They didn't even try to hide their intent but just attacked, which helped to give Exausia time to evacuate the non-combatants to their underground bunkers. Some bunkers were somewhat damaged from the battle but except for some trapped people there wasn't much to worry about. The trapped people would be easily freed with the average strength of Exausia's inhabitants. Broly looked at Aze. He was speaking deadpan. It wasn't his usual indifference but a bit different, it was like, King Broly, should we go eradicate that organization now? Taro's voice sounded out from the side. Broly turned around and saw Taro who was as deadpan as A's and instantly knew that something was up. Isn't it? Great news that no one died? Why are you looking like you lost your soul? Broly asked them, but only silence greeted him. After a while, 
Aze opened his mouth. Your Majesty, how much stronger do you get with Super Scion 3? HM? Well, four times stronger than the transformation into the Ascended Super Scion. So 800 by 4. It is a multiplier of 3,200 times my base. Your Majesty, didn't you say that an Ascended Super Scion is a 200 times multiplier and a Super Scion 3 is 800 times the base? Taro asked with a trembling voice. Well, it is for you guys. Mine is a bit different since legendary genes and all. As soon as his voice fell, silence reigned in the surroundings again. Taro suddenly fell on his knees and drops of tears fell on the ground. This is so unfair. Taro shouted sobbingly. Aze went to his side and patted his shoulder. Broly's mind was blank as he saw Aze console Taro before he thought about something. Taro, you could still stack Ikari. It would boost your Ascended Super Scion times 1.3, and with the Super Scion 3, it would boost you 1.1. Although it doesn't seem worth doing, I think as you are normal Scions, it would boost you even more than it does for me. Broly tried to console him. At the beginning, the two were rather close in strength, but the gap increased a lot during the years. Taro looked up with his tear-filled face. Re really you think so? He wiped away the tears before looking hopefully at Broly. Yeah, our genes are a bit different, but it's possible that your gains would be higher. Although you still have to train really hard as it is really difficult to achieve. The effort in stacking those powers isn't something to scoff at. Broly reassured him. Right, I couldn't stack it with my normal Super Scion yet, but with a few years dash, gains would be higher? 1.3 and 1.1. He suddenly interrupted Taro. Taro and Broly looked at him confused. They didn't know what he was pondering about. Those are very specific. Does that mean you can't strengthen your Ikari anymore? Taro's eyes widened as he heard that question. His eyes darted to Broly, who was staring into the empty air before smiling wryly at Taro. He didn't answer the question, but they knew what that meant. He had told them in the past that if he couldn't raise the strength of his Scion and Ozer power any higher, he would start experimenting with Super Scion 4. So, to close in the gap between Broly and Taro, it would be more reasonable to learn to control his Ozer form and reach Super Scion 3 as he could then skip Ikari and go straight into Super Scion 4, but until then how could Broly not have achieved it by then? Taro started sobbing even harder. Hey, should we move out soon to destroy them? I have already gathered the other elite teams to move out. Broly turned around and saw Kana reporting to him as if she didn't see Taro at all. Broly wanted to explain but before he could say anything, Kana put up a hand. I heard everything. It is good that we didn't have any casualties but we should move out as soon as possible. We can't make them get away with this. Although her word choice was typically fiery, she wasn't speaking with much enthusiasms. Broly didn't say anything but only nodded. He had learned better just now. They were flying to a platform where a few dozens of teams were gathered. Aliyah and Zhangya were waiting there as well. A second later they arrived and landed in front of the teams. After everyone had their attention on Broly, he started speaking with a commanding voice. All right, I know where their headquarters are, but we have to move out soon. I don't know if they won't abandon it and go into hiding after getting the news that their attack teams were wiped out. As he was speaking, Taro and Aze landed behind him. They both had stern expression as if nothing had happened. All right, we go in and crush them swiftly. I want no prisoners. The more you kill, the higher will be your reward. So, take on your scouters to record everything. After saying that he turned around and slashed the air with his arm. In an instant, a space hole had formed for the group to go through. He could have used Kai Kai, but it would take a while before everyone held each other and assured that no one was missing. This way, they only had to walk through it. Everyone went through the portal and appeared on a planet with rich purple flora. It was clear that life was thriving on this planet. Broly walked a short while to reach an edge of a cliff. He looked down onto the big city built on this planet. Thousands of assassins that were most loyal to the organization would be residing in here. Even if someone was one of the strongest assassins out there, if they weren't deemed as loyal, they wouldn't be able to live here. This was also a reason why Broly felt a bit uneasy as he thought about the whole situation. Broly was lucky that one of them had memories on the location of this place, otherwise he had no way of getting here. Broly thought it was weird that they sent out someone who was proven to be loyal but still sent them on a suicide mission. He first thought it was a trap and the memories were fabricated to lead them here. Broly shook his head as he thought he was being too paranoid. It wasn't clear that they knew of his full strength and that he was easily able to overwhelm and get the memories of their members. He looked down the edge on the city that was supposed to be here, but he found nothing, nothing would be incorrect. He found a giant pit as if something was removed from the ground. 
Someone tapped his elbow. He turned his head and saw Kana pointing at something in the air. Broly looked up and saw a tiny point in the sky. With his extraordinary sight, he was able to see what it was. A giant floating city with large thrusters at the bottom dashing into the distance. A flying city? Broly mumbled. Doesn't matter. Listen, they are trying to flee in their flying city. Bring it down for me and crush every single one of them. After saying that he threw in a healing capsule as did the others, he opened up another portal and immediately went through. It directly closed the distance and they were practically in front of the assassin's doorsteps. Without hesitation, Broly threw a key blast at the thrusters, but before it could do any damage, it was blocked by a giant blue sphere that glowed the moment the key blast hit it. Broly squinted his eyes. He had already sensed it with his vision of truth, but he didn't think it would be hard to break, but his attack didn't even leave behind a scratch. It had to be mentioned that he was currently using his normal legendary state as it was significantly less draining as the other two transformations. He quickly assessed the situation and figured that he wouldn't be able to destroy it quickly. Instead, he directly flew towards the buildings. The barrier was only protecting the lower half of the city. Around the city was only a barrier that held in the air. Broly was puzzled as of why they didn't have something protective above the city, but Broly ignored it and dashed into the range of the city. He didn't have to wait long until the first assassins noticed his arrival and started engaging him. The other scions followed him and started attacking the assassins. They went all out as they didn't have to worry about the surroundings. After all, this wasn't their home. Here, they could be as unrestrained as they wanted to be. Besides, Broly would probably wish to see more destruction. With that in mind, they attacked the city savagely without a single thought of consideration. Even the elves were more violently after they knew that those people here were the ones that had attacked them a moment ago. With the attack, many assassins started flocking the 100-odd exhaustions. Broly's elite teams were covering as much ground as they could as they attacked the incoming assassins. Most assassins had strange abilities which had shrouded the surroundings in colorful lights. Although the abilities were strange and had a numerical advantage on their side, it wasn't much in front of the destructive power of Exausia's most elite soldiers. The assassins could only be called mediocre compared to the Exausians. Not only couldn't most of them contend against the average elite, but as they saw a giant, no a beast, bulldozed through their ranks with just its body, panic quickly followed. Many attacks landed on that beast, but it seemed like it had no effect at all. Acid rain, paralysis, fireball. The attacks flashed with rays of lights, but the beast was running through them as if they were just splashing some water his way. Not only didn't he stop or slow down, he got even faster, the stronger the attacks became. It was like he got more excited as the fight went on. The beast was swatting the assassins like flies, but instead of sending the victim flying, every slap would rip apart its victim. Most were terrified after seeing it casually slap a guy, only to leave behind two legs. Of course, some were still confident. Flame Tsunami A giant wave made out of scorching flames was heading straight for the beast. The assassin that had used the attack was a high-ranked senior, known for his flame magic. It was said that even if he was deep underwater, he would still be able to create flames. His flames were said to have reached star-level temperatures. The other assassins were elated as they saw their senior take it upon himself to engage this beast. But before they could rejoice, their countenance changed into a terrified one. They saw how the beast didn't evade the tsunami of flames but just ran straight through it as if the flames didn't exist at all. The senior was flabbergasted as well. He couldn't believe that someone had ignored an attack that he took pride in. But there was nothing he could say anymore as the beast had already reached him. It didn't even look like the beast had noticed him as he was staring into the distance. The beast didn't even attack him but just ran against the senior. The senior wasn't able to react and was sent flying by a knee to his face. He flew for hundreds of meters until he crash landed on the ground. He was dazed and he heard his whole skull cracking with every moment. He was dizzy and didn't know for a second what happened until he noticed the trembling. He raised his head with effort to see what was heading his way, but he was only greeted with a giant foot. The assassins that were able to see the situation were frightened out of their wits. A high-ranking assassin was accidentally being squashed as the beast ran over him. The body with its squashed head was still twitching slightly. There was no need for more evidence for the assassins present. They weren't able to contend against that monster. Even the other stronger assassins that were previously confident in their abilities were avoiding it like a pest. Broly didn't bother with these little insects, as he would put it. He had his eyes at something different. While he was killing a few people, he sensed their life force fly towards a tower in the middle of the city. 
He didn't know what it was used for, but he sure as hell wouldn't let them continue whatever they wanted. He didn't worry about his team as Aaliyah and the others were enough to take care of the stronger assassins. As for the normal assassins, if there aren't too many, they were just easy prey for the elites. Broly dashed to the tower in a straight line. Whatever was between him and the tower didn't slow him down at all. Be it buildings, trees, or assassins, they were crushed, pierced, and ripped apart as he went through the city. On his way, he didn't forget to send out some casual key blasts to lessen the burden of his troop a bit. Just a casual wave of him was enough to decimate dozens of assassins and cause chaos in their ranks. Their fighting moral was heavily hit by this anomaly called Broly. In only a few seconds of dashing through the city, he left behind a trail of destruction and traumatized assassins. Only a few kilometers away from the tower, his eyes suddenly constricted, and he dodged to the side. For the first time he was here, he had to dodge an attack and deviate from his path. After he dodged, the ground where he just stood was split apart. Broly had already spotted the attacker. A 2.4 meter tall stout man with explosive muscles. He had a giant black sword on his shoulder. It absorbed all light in the surroundings. Broly frowned as he noticed that the space around that man was distorted and reality warped around him like he was about to leave this dimension. He knew that this person could travel through space and time with his sheer strength. He was far above the assassins on the level of Reap or Ko, who mostly relied on their unique abilities. It wouldn't even be far off to say that this person could give Broly a run for his money. Broly also speculated who this person was, the number one assassin. There were some rumors that had told of his might. It was said that he could slay any person from light years away without causing a single disturbance. Of course, Broly knew that legends and myths would be exaggerated with time, so previously he wasn't too concerned about this number one assassin. Even if those myths weren't exaggerated, if he put his mind to it, he could do feats that would overshadow those. But still now he needed had to reevaluate this assassin, especially because of his weapon. The sword of his, Broly couldn't sense it. It looked like there wasn't anything in that assassin's hands, like he was grabbing the air. Broly was only able to see it with his eyes, but otherwise it would be a blind spot for him. Broly studied the assassin in front of him. A tall, strong body, short red hair and red eyes with a gaze that seemed to pierce through anything. Pale skin with a lot of scars on his upper body. He didn't wear anything except for black pants. Even his feet were covered in scars. He looked more like a warrior than an assassin. Even his posture and his aura was that of a warrior, not of someone that attacked out of the shadows. Even if he attacked him without warning just a moment ago, for Broly it felt more like a welcoming. Besides, he even attacked from the front, which was also reason why Broly was able to evade the attack. Although he couldn't sense the sword, he saw how the assassin raised his hand and slashed down. With his instinct warning him, Broly had quickly evaded to the side. As Broly was studying the assassin, so was his opponent. Broly was standing three meters tall in his battle armor and gave off a terrifying aura that crushed the ground around him. After observing their opponents, their gazes met. For a moment, it looked like the center of the universe was those two that were about to face each other in the middle of a floating city. I suppose you are the strongest around here? Broly broke the silence. The assassin nodded slightly. He was silent for a moment before opening his mouth again. I heard about you, King Broly. The people in the light praise you and your subjects as the peace bringers and the ones in the dark call you a tyrant, who hunts them down like cattle. You are equally hated as you are worshipped. Broly raised an eyebrow. You know about me, but what about you? Mr. Number One Assassin. The assassin smiled slightly. I am just someone who threads the same path as you. I was known as Salutus. All right, enough chit chat. Let's get down to business. Broly said. His voice couldn't hide the thirst for battle any longer. He was here to completely eradicate this organization and after he defeated the backbone, the rest of the organization would inevitably fall with him. He put the tower into the back of his mind as he concentrated on the opponent in front of him. Even if he tried to go for the tower, he wasn't confident in escaping Salutus' pursuit unharmed. So, if he couldn't shake him off, he would just stomp him into the ground first. Broly didn't wait for a response and directly dashed towards Salutus. In an instant, he had reached his target. Broly's fist shot at Salutus like a bullet. Before his punch could hit him, Salutus leaned to the side, easily evading the punch, but he wasn't done. Broly couldn't keep up with Salutus' movement and only saw a knife hand heading for his chest. He quickly used Kai Kai to teleport a few hundred meters away. Broly frowned as he looked down. A shallow cut could be seen on his chest. Broly thought he evaded it successful, 
but he didn't expect that some energy of the strike followed him through space. As he thought about the exchange, he knew that Salutis was on another level, but Broly wasn't concerned, after all, he was still in his first form. A smile formed on Broly's face as he looked at his opponent, who had turned to him once again. Broly directly pushed his key to a higher level. He burst out with energy as his strength reached the next level. It only took Broly a moment to turn into an ascended legendary Super Scion. The ground around him was crushed from the pressure and formed a three-meter-wide crater. The increase of key burst out of Broly formed a green flame that burned around him. Sparks and arcs of lightning were circuiting inside the flames because of the high concentration of key. Everyone would instantly see the difference in power from before, even if that someone wasn't able to sense key. It wasn't only the key that was putting others around him under pressure, but a fierce and violent aura like that of a beast lingered around him. It was like he was declaring who of them was the predator and the prey, even if Broly didn't do it on purpose. However, Salutis seemed to be unimpressed by all this. He still held his sword over his shoulder like nothing happened. Broly had, of course, observed his reaction and from what he could tell, Salutis really didn't put him into his eyes. Still, Broly wouldn't go further for the time being. Although there were some assassins hiding in the shadows of the buildings, no one dared to step between the two. Broly as well as Salutis ignored their presence. After Broly had transformed, they only stood a few hundred meters apart without showing any signs of engaging again. Most of the assassins were retreating silently while still trying to take some glances at the battle between those two. However, it seemed like they wouldn't move at all. Suddenly, a thunderous clap overshadowed any sound in the city. It shook the very ground with just the sound, but what followed it was a shockwave that annihilated everything in the middle of the city. Broly's and Salutis' standing figure had already vanished and clashed with each other high in the air. The poor fools that wanted to take a glimpse at the fight and slowed down their retreat were instantly decimated by the energy caused by the collision. Midair, Broly's fist went numb after punching at Salutis, who blocked it quickly with his sword. The sword was obviously made out of something special, otherwise even Katshin would have broken under Broly's attack. Broly didn't retreat after his attack had failed and quickly followed up with a kick. His leg whipped at Salutis' side at extraordinary speed. Unexpectedly, Salutis was able to calmly block the kick with one arm. Salutis swung his sword at Broly's face. Broly quickly leaned backwards and tilted his face to the side. The blade tip scratched his cheek and drew a bit of blood but nothing serious. Salutis' sword made an arc and headed towards Broly a second time. Broly quickly decreased his height and flew backwards, coming out of harm's way. Broly was astonished at the speed Salutis was wielding this giant sword. It looked like he was swinging a small stick, but Broly knew better. After the punch, he had felt how heavy it was and it wasn't something to laugh at. Even worse were the attributes of the sword. It went through his key shield that was layered just above his skin like it was a piece of paper, however, that wasn't the real problem. It was how the sword was able to do it. Salutis hadn't used his sword to slice or smash his shield apart to cut him, but the energies were giving way on their own accord. He immediately felt the connection lost after his key shield came near the sword. Broly frowned deeply as he thought about this discovery. If what he concluded was true, then Broly raised his arm and directly fired a few key blasts as a distraction as he pushed immense key in his free hand. Like he speculated, Salutis just casually deflected those small attacks and directly dashed at Broly. He was rapidly closing in the distance to Broly. However, Broly didn't go into close combat but waved his other hand. A small pearl of concentrated energy that he had prepared flew out intercepting Salutis. Salutis didn't take it head on like the others, but his arm holding his sword turned into a blur, and a black line instantly divided the small pearl into two perfect halves. The two halves traveled past Salutis as if they were two attacked to begin with until they landed in the city. As soon as the attacks made contact with a building, a grand explosion devastated everything inside the explosion's periphery. Broly wasn't surprised at all and was already on his way to continue attacking. He appeared right behind Salutis and slapped at his back with an energy sphere glowing inside his palm. Salutis had already turned halfway and was slashing with his sword at Broly's head. Both attacks would land on the same time but Broly's smile was irritating Salutis. The time seemed to slow down for the two as they looked at each other. Salutis could clearly see how Broly's eyes were rapidly changing into a yellow color. Salutis sensed something wrong and directly retreated backwards, barely evading the suddenly accelerated slap. But unfortunate for him, the energy sphere in Broly's hand shot out and directly closed the gap. Salutis hadn't time to block the attack with his sword again, so he quickly raised his hand and shot out a key blast to meet Broly's attack. 
The two were close to each other and were directly enveloped by the explosion. A smoke screen prevented others from seeing their condition. A moment later, a figure was quickly backing out of the smoke. Salutis came out with a bit of disheveled hair and some black marks on his chest. After Salutis came out the smoke, it was instantly pushed away and dispersed. Now with the smoke dispersed, Broly was revealed again with long hair that was covering his whole back. The lightning that circuited around his body was still there but only several times stronger than before. Broly didn't have eyebrows in this form, which made his usual intimidating face even more terrifying. Salutis only smiled slightly seeing Broly transform into the legendary Super Scion 3. He had, of course, already seen it when Broly was fighting on Exausia and against Reap. Salutis was well aware that this was Broly's strongest form. He had seen the destructiveness of it when he transformed into it when he found his wife's body and then fought against Reap. It was really extraordinary. It was clear that Broly was one of the very strongest of this universe. Now that you've finally revealed this transformation, it seems like I can take you serious now, Salutis said with a smile on his face as he pointed his giant sword at Broly. Oh, you were waiting for it? Broly responded. Then let's see what tricks you have in store to stop me. Broly shouted as his body turned into a green beam as he shot towards Salutis. Salutis was able to follow Broly and saw how he directly arrived in front of him. Broly made a front flip with one leg extended, creating a powerful kick that sliced through the air directly heading for Salutis' head. Salutus smiled ferociously as he watched Broly's attack heading his way. Just as Broly's kick was about to connect, Salutus' body started moving several times the speed of Broly. He slashed his sword upwards, intending to meet with the kick and slice the leg off. Broly had noticed the sudden increase in strength. Broly's leg were instantly enveloped by a strange glow which shot up the speed of his attack by several times, exceeding the speed of Salutus. As a result of the sudden speed difference, Salutis didn't have a chance to defend and was heavily kicked to the city. Like a meteor, Salutis crashed into the flying city, which stopped the city's flight for a moment. The city was even slightly being pushed to the ground again. The force was just too great for the thrusters of the city. Broly didn't follow up as he looked at the gigantic crater that devastated kilometers of the structure of the city. Broly stared down at the smoke screen that covered the city. He stared at the point in the smoke where Salutis crash landed. In the attack just now, he had to use Kaka's fighting style to accelerate his kick and come out of top against Salutis. He had vastly underestimated this assassin. He really hadn't expected to have met this powerhouse now. What surprised him, however, was the fact that he didn't remember the name, Salutis, on the list of the 100 most powerful beings in this universe. The first ranked opponents that he had met were assassins from this organization. Reap and Co. were ranked 16th and 18th respectively on the list, and there were at least 10 more that were on the list of the 100 strongest beings. It was only obvious to assume that Salutis would be on the list as well. Logically, he should be at least in the top 10 or even higher approaching the title of the strongest, but he was nowhere to be found. Broly thought that Salutis might not be his real name, but thinking about his warrior-like demeanor that was highly unlikely. Maybe he isn't from this universe, or he couldn't be detected in this dimension by Shenlong. Either way, Salutis could be said to be the strongest being Broly had ever fought if he excluded Mechikabura and his daughter. The ground of the city was trembling as a whooshing sound underground became louder. Broly merely watched on and waited for Salutis to come back up. He had some suspicion on how Salutis was able to suddenly increase his speed when Broly kicked him. The smoke was scattered by a wind blast as Salutis finally emerged from the ground. A bit of blood was running down his forehead. Salutis wiped it away before it could get into his eyes. He coldly looked at Broly who was calmly hovering in the air. Broly was scrutinizing Salutis' every movement. Salutis didn't exchange any words but directly dashed towards Broly. In just a blink of an eye, he reached Broly and swung his sword. Broly's eyes turned yellow once again and his body gave off steam as he stepped backwards to evade the attack. Just as Broly thought he had evaded the attack, a strange energy shot out of the blade splitting everything in its path as it aimed for Broly's neck. Broly's skin turned slightly red and more steam was coming out of his body. Broly suddenly accelerated his evasion and barely came out of the attack and scathed. Broly was currently burning his life force to keep up. Of course, Salutis didn't wait for Broly's turn and directly followed up with a barrage of attacks. Broly was being pushed away by the dangerous blade that threatened to split him apart with a single slash. After he recognized its properties, Broly knew that his key or magic barriers would be sliced apart without being able to slow it down at all. 
He could only use his body to contend with the blade, and Broly didn't need to directly meet Blade with his hand to know that he would be cut up. Still, this didn't mean he couldn't use Key Blasts. After all, Salutis himself wasn't immune to Key Blasts and would need to slash any strong incoming energy attacks with his sword. Broly, in the middle of evading, shot out some Key Blasts at Salutis to distract him and make him focus on deflecting the attack. After getting a breather, Broly charged up an attack and directly fired at Salutis. This time it wasn't a key sphere but a key beam that was shooting at Salutis. Salutis, however, only raised his sword and continued to close in the distance between the two. The beam was split into two as soon as it met the tip of the blade, giving Salutis a clear path. Broly realized that it was futile and his whole body started glowing slightly. It was similar to when he kicked Salutis. Salutis seemed to have felt something and had obviously seen it as well and started lowering the number of attacks. His slashes became less frequent but also stronger and faster. It was clear that he wouldn't hit Broly with his barrage of attacks. So instead he tried to focus his energy on faster attacks and surprise Broly with its sudden increase in speed. But Salutis wasn't able to hit Broly no matter how fast his attacks became. Given, his attacks weren't able to become much stronger, only 10 or 15% of its original power, but such an increase would be deadly in this kind of high-level battle. Broly's eyes flashed as he saw that. He was currently using Kakus fighting style on his whole body. Although it was very straining on his soul to cover his whole body, he could still keep it up for some time. He stopped analyzing Salutis' fighting style and directly closed in. Just as Broly approached Salutis, his sword suddenly accelerated and was about to behead Broly. Salutis' eyes widened as he saw his sword less than a centimeter away from Broly's skin, but before he could touch it, Broly's figure suddenly turned into a blur as it suddenly ducked under the sword and crossed the distance between the two. The glow on Broly's body lessened and focused on just his arms. Salutis was mid-swing and because he had increased the strength to his maximum, he wouldn't be able to retract his sword to keep Broly at a distance. Salutis gritted his teeth as all his muscles flexed in order to create some distance while also giving a counterattack with his free hand. He punched out with all his might at Broly's head. Cacus fist style. Broly's arms were giving off steam at the moment and his eyes were practically glowing as he put all his weight in his punches. His arms turned into a blur and seemed to have vanished, only to be replaced by hundreds of mirages that were shooting towards Salutis. In less than a fraction of a second, Broly's fist hammered down countless times on Salutis. Salutis' fist that was counterattacking was crushed and his arm bent in an unnatural angle. Red fist marks covered every part of Salutis' upper body and face. The steel-like muscles were now dented with fist marks. Steam was coming from the red glowing fist marks. It was like his whole body was freshly branded. Broly breathed out after finishing his attack and seemed somewhat exhausted. Salutis was still conscious. His eyes were still glowing with determination. He coughed out some blood. Against all expectation, he calmly wiped away the blood with the back of his hand that was holding his sword and then smiled at Broly. Broly frowned as he looked at Salutis, or rather the arm that was holding the sword. Broly had, of course, targeted some attacks on his sword-wielding arm, but to Broly's surprise Salutis' arm only had some bruises. In contrast, his other hand that he punched once was completely useless now. There was also something else. After landing so many hits on Salutis' body and especially on the arm wielding the sword, he noticed some similarities to himself in Salutis. To be more precise, the Cacus fighting style. While clashing with Salutis, he had felt that they weren't only clashing on a physical level but on a spiritual as well. He first figured that Salutis was using mental energy to enhance himself but that wasn't the case. Now Broly was sure. Salutis had fused his soul into his flesh and it wasn't something temporary like Broly does with his fighting style. It seems like, Che, you have figured it out. Salutis was speaking with difficulties. He was already heavily injured and the winner was already decided. What could he do with only one arm? Of course, Broly didn't think this way, he wouldn't rest until he gave the finishing blow. Broly's whole body began to glow again and he turned into a light beam, instantly reaching Salutis. Salutis' eyes were bloodshot as he stabbed his sword at Broly's head. Broly easily sidestepped the attack while closing in and stabbed at Salutis' chest with his fingers, trying to rip out his heart. Just as he was about to reach Salutis, Broly sensed something from the sword. It gave Broly a serious sense of danger. Without hesitation, Broly jumped back. As he retreated, a black sphere rapidly expanded out of the sword, swallowing everything within. Broly was frantically retreating. He could feel the pull of this thing. Only a few hundred meters away did the black sphere stop expanding. Broly frowned as he looked at the giant sphere in front of him. 
Salutus' voice suddenly rang out from the sphere. Broly, you are indeed strong. If I hadn't fused my soul with my body, you would have decimated me long ago. Broly was, of course, dissatisfied. He recognized that Salutus' voice didn't sound as injured as before. The black sphere suddenly shrunk again. It returned and formed into the sword again. Salutus had significantly healed. There were only slight bruises covering his body. He looked at his sword in his hand. TCH. This will take a while to recover. Broly looked at the area the sphere was just a moment ago. Everything in the area was consumed. When Broly was looking at it with his vision of truth, he couldn't see anything. Just darkness. Space and time surrounding the area slowly filled up the area again. Salutus was standing in the middle of it with a serene expression as he focused back on Broly. I have to thank you. You delivered what I wanted. Broly suddenly realized that the demeanor and aura changed of Salutus. Broly now felt uneasy as he looked at Salutus. Salutus was no longer a warrior type, but a sly snake coiling around him, and then it vanished completely. This bastard fooled me? Broly was always confident in his vision, but now every energy signature had disappeared from Salutus like it was never there to begin with. He could only see and not sense him. Now there is only one thing that I need you for. Salutus seemed to materialize what looked like a remote. Broly was already dashing towards him, but before he could reach him, Salutus had pressed on the button. The whole city seemed to tremble, and a loud noise resembling that of an opening gate sounded out. With his ability to even fool his senses, it would be foolish of Broly to let him escape. If Salutus was out there, Broly wouldn't be sure when he would strike him or his family and friends. He had to end him no matter what. So, even though the whole city seemed to be rumbling and something major was happening, Broly completely ignored it as he rushed towards Salutus. Broly accelerated to his maximum with his body being powered by his soul and his life force burning at its highest rate. He moved so fast that Salutus was only able to take a glimpse at his fleeting figure. After pressing the button, he had already waved his sword, creating a rift into the universe itself. Just as he was already halfway inside the rift, Broly arrived. With his knife hand, he slashed at Salutus. Salutus' eyes widened as his mind went blank. Broly's hand was glowing fiercely in different colors. Life force, magic, he and his soul powered his hand to its peak, creating a dangerous blade around it. It was Broly's strongest strike he could muster. Of course, such an attack was in no way endurable by Salutus. A deep red line formed from the top of his head down to the bottom, dividing him in two halves. Salutus had an astonished expression as he had yet to realize what happened. Suddenly his hand twitched, wanting to do something, but that movement couldn't escape Broly's eyes and he slashed once again, instantly cutting off his hand. The two halves of Salutus split apart and one fell into the rift. Broly fired a key blast inside the rift, landing squarely on Salutus' body half. Afterwards the rift that Salutus wanted to escape with closed again, leaving no trace behind that there was once a rift. Broly was surprised as he looked at the perfectly fine fabric of reality. Although space and time had yet to fill up this area again, it was still within this universe. Salutus actually wanted to escape out of the universe, and if he had succeeded, Broly would have stood no chance in following him. Of course, as decisive as Broly was, he didn't give Salutus any time to escape. To ensure the kill of Salutus, he had completely burned his remaining life force, emptied his magic and key, and pushed his soul to its limit. Broly involuntarily cancelled his transformation and retracted his soul. He had no remaining strength left to fly and fell to the ground. His strengthless body fell onto a high building and directly crashed through a few floors before stopping. Broly was exhausted but he had accomplished what he came for. After today the former members of this organization would only be roaming assassins without anyone backing them. Without a backer, those with bad blood with some assassins wouldn't have to fear any repercussions when they hunted those down. These assassins would be devoured in no time. Broly could be happy with the result. But there was one thing that prevented him from being it. Broly stood up and walked his way to a hole on the side. He could see his elite soldiers flying his way with Aaliyah and the others at the front. It seemed like they had already cleared the city of any living creature. Broly looked into the sky and saw a fuzzy barrier surrounding the city. Even with his vision he could barely see through the barrier and see chaotic threads of pure energy. They were rapidly moving through the mess with a tunnel securing their path. It seemed like Salutus wanted them to head somewhere, but how could Broly figure out what Salutus wanted? One half of his brain was somewhere lying on the ground. It was too late to read his mind, 
but Broly knew that what happened was the best possible option. He would have regretted it if Salutis was able to run away. Either way, he had to quickly replenish his energy and preserve through anything that might be coming their way. Broly threw in a healing capsule and he instantly felt his ki being rapidly replenished. His life force was somewhat being refilled but most importantly his cells were being reconstructed. Although he could easily enter Super Saiyan 3, it still was a huge burden on his cells, especially at the end when he pushed his strength to its limit. Most of the cells in his arms burst open and made his arms completely red from inner bleedings. However, Broly knew that after healing, he would be even stronger, and with a healing capsule he wouldn't need to wait for long. The only problem was his soul. He had strained it heavily again and needed some time to heal, but fortunately for him it wasn't as severe as previously. Although he only needed some weeks to recover from that soul injury, it didn't seem like they had that much time to wait for it. Aaliyah and the others quickly landed behind him inside the building. They saw that Broly was somewhat pale, but still in a good shape. Broly, do you know what is happening? Taro asked he looked into the sky. Broly was probably the only one that was able to see what was behind the barrier. We are being transported somewhere unknown, but it will certainly be troublesome. Broly responded seriously. The other elites were somewhat worried as they knew of Broly's might. If he said it would be troublesome, wouldn't it be certain death for them? Just as he contemplated about what to do, Aze approached him with a young man around their age. He was around his twenties. Broly knew through observing the man's life force. Broly, we have a new super scion in our ranks. Aze reported as he presented the young man. The man kneeled down on one knee to show his respect. My lord, I, Lutch at your service. Broly nodded. Very good. You are now amidst the strongest scions ever born. You will need to take responsibility for your team for now. Unfortunately for you, we have tough times ahead of us. So be prepared. This goes for you too. Broly turned to the other elites. Go rest for now, we are only able to rest until we arrive. Use the time we have, Broly shouted. Broly patted the young super scion on the shoulder and jumped out of the building. The other elites did as they were told and started sitting down and threw healing capsules in their mouths. Aze and Kana guarded them in case an assassin was able to hide from them. Aaliyah, Zhangya, and Taro followed Broly outside. Aaliyah was the first one to speak up concernedly. Are you sure we should wait? We don't know what will happen once we have reached our destination. Broly nodded as a response. Indeed, but I do know what will happen if we force our way out or stop the city. The others aren't strong enough to endure the chaotic energy outside. They will be ripped apart in seconds. We would be luckier and endure for much longer, but I am not sure if we could leave that space safely. We will bet our luck in whatever Salutis had prepared for us. Salutis? Aaliyah asked as he had never heard of that name. She could guess that it was the one Broly was fighting as for the identity of that person. She had no idea. Yeah, the number one assassin and the backbone of this organization. He said that he would need me for one other thing. He also said that I had delivered something, but as to what I don't know. Fact is, he wanted to clash with me. <clears throat> Still, he severely underestimated me. Broly didn't say anything anymore and bend down to grab something in between the rubble. He pulled out the black sword that Salutis was wielding. Broly threw the hand that was still holding onto the sword onto the ground and pulverized it with a key blast. The other half of Salutis' body was lying not far from the sword. Broly waved his hand and pulverized Salutis. Unfortunately, the remote fell into the rift with the other half. Maybe he could have reversed the direction of the city, but now wasn't to think in what ifs. Clink. Hmm. Broly looked at the spot where he pulverized Salutis and found a golden triangle. Broly held it up and frowned slightly. It was like the sword, he couldn't sense it with his vision. Obviously, it wasn't made out of something ordinary as well if it withstood Broly's attack just now. Additionally, it was something Salutis wore on him, so it had to be something of importance. With that in mind, he observed it for a while before putting it in his pocket. After half an hour of waiting for the journey to end, the city started rumbling and slowed down tremendously like it crashed into water. Broly and his company had already gathered and were quietly waiting. As Broly looked outside of the blurry barrier, he saw the city was touching a gigantic portal. The city pushed forward straight into it. A bright light started enveloping the edge of the city that was pointing towards the portal. With the second, this curtain of light moved across the barrier of the city until the city had crossed the portal. The other elites were somewhat calm, which seemed to be a result of Broly's presence. His steadfast and confident demeanor infected them like a virus until they faced their nature with determination. 
Broly didn't say anything as he stood in front of the group. He was the first to welcome and enter the portal. Even his vision of truth was temporarily blinded, which was bizarre, as he could normally see through other rifts with no difficulties. Although the sword and the golden triangle could obstruct his vision, they couldn't blind him. Because his vision of truth was useless for the moment, he observed the surroundings with his eyes, used his other senses to notice if something was happening. His body was tense, and his senses were sharpened to its highest degree. He had already turned into his third legendary state and used Ikari as he pushed himself to the peak. He even held Saluta's sword tightly in one of his hand. Although he wasn't a swordsman, he could still swing it around. It would prove useful for any energy attacks that might be coming his way. The bright surroundings slowly faded and revealed a floating island to Broly's senses. It wasn't far away. To Broly, this bit of land looked like it was once part of paradise. Lush green flora, butterflies and the chirping of birds. There was even a rainbow spanning across the island. Numerous waterfalls were flowing down the island. Strangely, however, as Broly looked for the source of these waterfalls, he saw that it was coming out of the sky, which looked like a colorful nebula. The nebula wasn't only in the sky, but it was also covering everything below the floating island. To be more precise, it surrounded everything around them. It looked like besides the island, there was nothing but nebula. He tried to pry into the nebula with his vision of truth and as he expected his senses were obstructed. In fact, he couldn't even pry into the lush forest on the island. It was like this whole area was covered by a veil. Broly looked at the floating island and observed it shortly. He squinted slightly as he discovered something. He shouted out as soon as he was sure. Prepare yourself. We will leave this city and land on an island to the front. Broly said as he looked at the island that seemed to gain altitude. But Broly knew that that wasn't the case. He had sensed that the thrusters that were letting the city fly began to lose power. The city wouldn't make the distance towards the island. Exauja's elites shouted out in confirmation and immediately prepared themselves for departure. Since they had half an hour for rest, they were instantly prepared and made their way to the edge of the city. They couldn't see through the blurry barrier but since their king said there was an island to the front, there would be an island to the front. Broly looked down and saw a seemingly endless nebula. He didn't know what would await them down there, and he wasn't eager to find out. He waited a bit for the island to get closer and then waved his arm. A key sphere shot out and instantly landed on the barrier. With a grand explosion, the barrier shattered into peace. It was fortunate to Broly and his group that the defensive abilities of this barrier inside seemed to be almost non-existent. As soon as the barrier shattered, the view of the island was revealed to their naked eyes. Broly didn't hesitate and directly jumped off the city, destroying the ground under his feet in the process. His body flew near the island while keeping in check that the others were closely following behind him. The last thing he wanted was for the group to be involuntarily split apart. Fortunately, nothing attacked or anything weird happened. They gathered together and flew towards the island. It didn't take them long to arrive and they searched for a small clearing in the lush flora that awaited them on the island. They didn't have to search for long to find a small clearing of 10 meters in the forest. Broly and the others were still vigilantly looking around for a beast on this paradisiacal island. Broly looked around as he scoured through the surroundings, but his concentration broke as soon as he stepped onto the ground. He felt like he was about to be crushed by a gigantic sun, which that was pressing on every single cell in his body. The king heavily fell on his knees. The ground under his knees were directly cracked open. He stabilized his body with his hands. His face grimaced as he even felt breathing difficult. He regulated his breath and slowly stood up again. It wasn't like gravity that pressed him into the ground but an overall pressure on his whole body. He only fell down because he was surprised. He urged his key to the maximum, but to his surprise he involuntarily transformed back into his base and he couldn't turn Super Scion, no matter how much he urged his key. If he felt this kind of pressure that forced him out of his transformation, wouldn't the others be instantly crushed into a bloody mess? He looked at the others and saw the elites watching them confusedly. Taro, Aze, Aaliyah, Kana, and Zongya were frowning and seemed to have difficulties in moving around as well. However, it looked like they had a much easier time than Broly. Broly looked at the other elites. Do you feel any pressure? The elites only shook their head. Only Aaliyah and the others were confirming it. All right, we will make ourselves familiar with the surroundings first. Considering the size of the island, we will be staying the night. We don't know how long we will be staying here, so look for a water and food source. Lutch, you will lead a team of ten to scout the area for animals. Broly divided the group and gave them tasks to fulfill. 
Good thing that elves had a natural affinity with nature and were quickly able to find a river with drinkable water. Lutch and his team were able to find some animals they could eat. The animals didn't seem to be strong at all and could be easily hunted by the fierce scions. Broly had decided to stay on this island at least for the day. The elites had fought two difficult battles in a row. First when the assassins attacked their home and then on their counterattack. They weren't in the conditions to explore this dangerous terrain. Of course, the scions may be alright, but the elves and the other races that joined them would be hard-pressed to go through anything more. Besides, Broly was near to useless right now. He could move around and speak like a normal person but forget fighting, even running would leave him breathless. Aaliyah and the others on the other hand were in a much better position. They were still able to transform but even if they turned Super Scion too, they would only be slightly stronger than Lutch who had just turned Super Scion for the first time. The difference between their strength now and before they arrived were like heaven and earth. Previously they were very close to the peak of their universe, now they would only be called strong by the average expert. Although they were dissatisfied and worried, they didn't dare to say anything. After all, there was one who experienced a drop of strength incomparable to theirs. Broly could be said to be in the top five in the universe or even the strongest, but now, even an average elite would be able to defeat him. If it weren't for his strong body, he could have been easily killed. He didn't complain, however. He looked around the forest to get some information out of the surroundings. He regulated his breathing, meditated, circulated his key, magic, and life force in order to ease up the pressure. There was only one option that helped him, though, it was to use his soul. With it, he would gain tremendous strength, and it could be said to be close to when he transformed to an ascended legendary Super Scion, but it was problematic to use right now. His soul was still damaged and needed rest. He would only worsen his condition if he strained it even more. Still, it was a good thing to have something up his sleeve. While he waited for the day to die out, he conditioned his body in order to find more useful things that could boost his strength. He would move out on the next day in order to find out what Salutis wanted him on this island for. Broly looked into the sky and saw the nebula becoming even dimmer than before, announcing the night in this strange place. Broly was surrounded by the other S-fighters as they were going through the thick forest. The elites were behind them in case of an ambush. There were two teams of scouts in the front, obscured to the naked eyes of the rest. From time to time they would inform Broly of anything they saw on the way and what route would be easier. They had no choice but to use this slow approach of moving through the forest as they couldn't fly. After they set foot on this island, they were somehow bound by it. They could still jump and use key to stay in the air for a moment, but as soon as it reached 10 seconds that they were spending in the air, something pulled them down again. Since most of them had strong bodies they could endure the fall and the crash landing, but this would only invite trouble in this place they have no idea about. They would be seen by all in the air and even if a creature was blind after the crash landing, those would easily be able to locate them as well, they were a large group after all. For now, they went as stealthy as they could through the thicket. After walking for a while, Broly felt something resonate within himself. It felt similar to when he circulated the techniques to absorb the crystals. It also felt like the kind of connection he had on Perdidus with the heart in the temple where he found the crystal star map. Broly's eyes widened at the possibility of the crystals being on this island. His whole being was resonating with it, which would mean that all three crystals were on this planet and possibly on the same spot as well. Broly was elated of the fact that an origin spirit crystal might be on this island. He could instantly heal his soul. Although he was delighted at this fact, he still remained cautious. In fact, he became even more cautious as he knew that Salutis wanted him here for something. Salutis had also sent some assassins to the spirit crystal where Broly healed himself. Rohair. Suddenly a deep roar rang out, sending a shiver down the elite's spine. The S-fighters were unfazed and looked at the same spot to the right side front. They had already pinpointed the creature through the roar. The leaves were blowing away because of the wind. The trees were shaking, and the ground started vibrating. Whoosh! A few fast figures shot out of the thicket to the front and immediately arrived in front of the group. Broly and the other S-fighters had already moved to the front and greeted the two teams of scouts. Three members of the scouts had vicious claw and bite marks on their shoulders and arms. Broly told them to go into the center of the group and rest there for now. Lutch, Toma, Alv, Ace called out some names and didn't have to wait long for the people to arrive in front of them. Ace told them to prepare for battle and to engage the beast that was coming at them. Lutch would be the one that would have to deal with a frontal clash as he was the strongest one of them and probably the only one that could directly engage the beast. The group that were about to fight the beast were tense and remained silent as they focused on the forest in front. 
The forest was growing louder as the beast was running at them in full throttle. The ground was trembling hard, and in the next moment the massive trees in the front splintered into thousand smithereens as a being ran straight through them. With a deep roar, a five-meter-tall bear was bouncing at the closest figure which happened to be Lutch. Lutch had turned into a super scion as soon as the trees shattered and was ready to engage as the bear arrived. The bear jumped at Lutch with both its claws slashing at Lutch. Lutch didn't dodge but stepped forward and caught the thick claws with his bare hands. The bear was overpowering Lutch as it pushed him backwards, but Lutch wasn't the only one present. The other elites were instantly attacking the bear from the sides as Lutch was holding it in place. Broly looked at their coordination with a satisfied smile on his face. The others were giving nods of acknowledgement as well. The group in front of them was whittling away the strength of the bear in an effective way. The S-Fighters had already discussed this before. They were aware who was the closest in breaking through to become a Super Scion, so they picked them out to engage against this bear and future threats. From the roar, they were already somewhat aware of its strength and it wouldn't be too much to ask those to kill it with the help of Lutch. If this forest didn't contain any danger, they would just move through it and explore the land. If it did, however, they would nurture more super science to increase the competence of the overall group. Of course, there were also some people of other races, but those wouldn't be able to have this kind of jump in strength in a short amount of time, so they ignored them for now and gave them other tasks where they would be more beneficial. They didn't have to wait long for them to kill the bear and the other elites quickly dissect it and threw it on the food pile they were carrying with them. He was especially beneficial for these kinds of moments as they didn't need long to barbecue the meat. Broly had slightly adjusted the route towards the location he felt the sensation coming from. He had first asked the others about it, but none of them was able to sense something. It was like it was specifically calling for Broly. In a single day they had crossed a long distance and encountered some beasts that considered them as food, but in the end were only added to their food pile. Broly looked up and saw that the nebula was dimming and with it he had called the end of the day. With the help of the elves, they were able to easily find a water source to drink from. They put up a camp not far from the pond they found and had quite the feast before they went to sleep with a few elites on guard. In the night, the S-Fighters and Lutch were responsible as the captain in the night and would make sure that the area was secure. Broly, of course, knew that they could go on for some days without sleep, water, or food, but that wouldn't be a wise thing to do in their situation. He didn't know if he could leave this place before the first person collapsed or if they could escape at all. Broly had already pried deep into the nebula or at least tried to and he wasn't sure if they would be able to go through it. Besides, there was the problem that they couldn't fly anymore. Broly suspected that they could jump off the edge of this island and then fly but for now they were bounded to the rules of the island. He would first figure out what Salutis wanted. It most certainly had something to do with the connection that he felt. On the next day they advanced deeper into the island and the deeper they went the stronger the beasts became. Additionally, even without his vision of truth, Broly felt the life force around them getting richer. There were plenty of fruits around them and animals seemed to thrive here even more. The bodies of every animal became stronger and tougher. Every fruit and piece of meat they ate seemed to give them more energy to go on longer than before. Since the new day, they had walked through the forest for a few hours already and what greeted them was surprising. Ruins of buildings that nature had reclaimed were laid out in front of them. There were some statues scattered around and above something that resembled an entrance door were some markings that seemed to be letters. Of course, most markings were only found in pieces on the ground and could only be assembled back together to know its meaning, if someone understood the language that is. Broly had a frown on his face as he looked at the markings carved into the strange stone. He could tell that the stone that the buildings were made of were incredible tough, but also had already endured the passage of time. Broly picked up a piece and touched the markings, which immediately started to glow slightly. These letters looked very similar to the pictures in the temple on Perdidus. Broly was now sure. These buildings were created by that ancient civilization, the original owners of the origin crystals. Broly didn't know much about this civilization. The only things he knew were from the pictures in the temple on Perdidus. The pictures depicted that their world was attacked, but with the power of the crystals their planet was moved and was inhabited by other races. It later came to be what Broly knew as Perdidus. As a consequence of their escape, the three Origins crystals splintered into fragments and scattered in the vast universe. Maybe even into other universes? But Broly couldn't confirm this as he wasn't outside his universe yet. He had been to other timelines, but it was still in Universe 7. Even the realm of the demons was only an extension of his universe. Broly knew of the locations of the crystals in his universe through the star map and knew the techniques to absorb the corresponding crystals, but more than that he didn't really had an idea of that civilization. So, 
If Salutis wanted something from him, it had to be because of either his knowledge about the locations of the crystals or his knowledge about the techniques. But how would he make Broly give him this knowledge? It would be either if he had defeated Broly in battle and then read his mind or make Broly voluntarily give him the information he wanted. But then again, he didn't really need to bring him here, now did he? Broly shook his head and threw the stone with the markings to the ground. Stay together. We will head north for another four hours. Broly shouted as he looked around and saw nothing more of interest. The others had already made a quick search inside the ruins, but there didn't seem to be anything left from the time when the civilization was around. Broly already assumed this since it was probably a few million years ago when the civilization last lived here. The collapsed buildings didn't offer any way of protection as well as the roofs and the walls on the side had large holes in it. The ruins around them seemed to be coming from smaller buildings. Although the buildings were made of some kind of stone, it was clearly a small village or a suburban. So, even if they found an acceptable ruin, it was unlikely to be able to hold them all. After hearing his shout, the others quickly followed Broly and the other leaders of Exausia. They happened across some beasts which the elites could barely defeat. There were some that were heavily injured by what Broly would describe as an oversized saber-tooth tiger. However, Broly was satisfied with the result. Those that were injured showed signs of a breakthrough and with the constant pointers of the other super scions, they would surely break through soon. Of course, Broly knew that some were braver than others and would not hesitate to engage a beast that was out of their league and those were the ones that would either die or turn into a super scion first. Broly was actually eager to see more transform. Previously, he didn't look closely on those scions as he was more concerned about his personal strength, but now it was different. The surroundings are increasingly dangerous, and he wasn't alone. It was paramount for more people to be able to contend against stronger foes. Previously, it was always him or the other leaders that were fighting the stronger enemies like the middle or high-class assassins, even if most of the assassins were substantially weaker than any of the S-fighters. He didn't need baggage but strong warriors that could take off some burden of the others. It was also important for future operation that were on galactical or even universal levels. He also noticed that those that were trained by A's were above the others in terms of tactics and using every technique they got to maximize their effect, be it their key blasts or close combat. They were also calm and collected when they fought, which was also characteristic of A's who rarely lost his cool. But that was also a bit disadvantageous for the Scions. They weren't built for such a battle style. It happened to be good for A's, but certainly not for the average Scion. Broly took it onto himself to teach them how to dig out strength out of their emotions. Broly needed them to be more savage on this island. After thinking about it and discussing it with the others, they created a training plan for the elites to develop properly. It wouldn't be wrong to say that this marked the start of a hellish training for the elites and a lot of lost blood. But Broly made sure to take turns so the whole group wouldn't be exhausted. Also, with him naming it a training regime, it would take some of the environmental pressure of them. Aaliyah had raised her concerns that they would easier die as a consequence. But Broly didn't give in. With the meat and fruits giving them more energy, he wasn't concerned that they couldn't heal from wounds. It would only be a problem if they were killed instantly but to counter that possibility, the group would have a super scion as their supervisor. Lutch would ultimately take over this role and make sure that no one dies, which was a way to train him as well, at least his awareness. So, instead of fighting a beast with ten people, they would engage it with five and each of them would be handicapped by something. Blindfolded, arms tied together, earplugs and all other kinds of limitations were brought onto them to develop their adaptivity, their mental strength and their willpower to preserve under extreme conditions. For other races, it was no different from sending them to die, but the Scions seemed to be happy to have the opportunity to train with a training plan made by Broly. Broly nodded satisfied as he watched their excited expressions. Some started right away and began to warm up. Although they thought of ways to make the other Scions grow and announced it to the Scions that would take part in it, they didn't stop moving deeper into the forest. They had already moved past the ruins and were once again in the dense thicket. For another few hours of walking until the elvish scouts discovered a dome-like structure with a building attached to it. It had a split opening at the top. Broly felt that it looked like an observatory from his past life as he approached it. Broly decided to check it out and perhaps use it for the night as the night was already approaching. The observatory seemed to be mostly undamaged and would be enough for a night. Broly and the other S-Fighters headed in first to see if it wasn't too dangerous for the other Scions. Otherwise, if there were some beasts, they would send them in for battle. They cautiously walked inside the building and then headed for the dome structure through it. From an open door at the end of a short floor, they heard some heavy breathing coming from inside the dome structure. Aaliyah walked at the front as she was currently the strongest. 
They all had already turned Ascended Super Scion as they weren't concerned that their key could be sensed. After all, it wasn't only Broly's senses that were blocked or limited to be precise. He and the others could only blurrily sense something if it wasn't obstructed by anything. So, if they were in the same room, they could sense that something was inside the room with them, as for how big or how the creature looked like was impossible for them to know. The door was dimly glowing, presumably cause of the outside nebula. After all, it wasn't complete dark outside, unlike inner rooms. The S-Fighters moved inside and saw a pride of lions sleeping on the ground. There were bones and skulls of many kinds of creatures scattered around, but none of them seemed to have humanoid characteristics. The lions had black fur and their bodies were packed with muscles. The protruding fangs were long and looked ferociously, especially with the blood smeared on their mouths. Broly and the others were looking at each other and estimated if they should let the elites deal with them. They wandered between the sleeping lions and counted them to see if there were too many for the elites to handle. After confirming 27 adult lions, they turned to the door again to walk outside and sent the elites inside, but after turning to the door they saw a huge shadow being cast. They turned towards the split opening of the roof and in front of the opening, they saw a majestic golden lion standing on a raised platform. It seemed to glow slightly, and it released a somewhat strange aura that put the exhaustions under pressure. The pressure wasn't that it was so much more powerful than they were, but they rather felt like this lion isn't supposed to exist and it made them feel uncomfortable. It was a very strange feeling for them. Growling, what do you want here? The lion spoke. No, the lion wasn't really speaking, but it was communicating with them telepathically. Broly stepped forward and met the lion's gaze. We want to stay the night. The lion squinted slightly as he scrutinized Broly. You can answer me? Broly was a bit confused as he heard the question. Wasn't the lion speaking to him? We six can, yes. Broly motioned to the others as he spoke. Fascinating. You are the first that I spoke to for years. The lion jumped down the platform and landed directly in front of Broly. With his four meter tall frame, he was towering above the others, but they all still had the same thought. He is smaller up close. It wasn't that four meters of height was small and the lion's claws weren't intimidating. It was just that the aura made them think that he was even bigger and more powerful. Any other beasts that they encountered in this forest were in the same size category. Even the buildings seemed to be built for humanoids that were at least twice the size of the average scion. I see. Are you the leaders of the group outside? The lion asked as he pointed through the walls with his snout. Yes, we had a long day and we will stay here for the night. Broly didn't want to move in the night since most beasts seemed to be more active and stronger then. If that was the only problem then he might consider taking the group to go train them, but Broly and the other S-Fighters felt weaker. They didn't notice it at first, only after a beast had attacked them at night did Kana notice that she seemed to be even weaker. The others had of course tested their powers and it was the same for them as well. They wouldn't be able to give as much support as they could during daytime. So, Broly would rather fight it out now with the lions here than to go through the forest in hope to find something else. The lion was quiet for a moment. All right, we will go hunting now anyway. Rower! The lion woke the other black lions up. They slowly woke up and immediately snapped to attention as they saw Broly's group standing in their territory. But before they could bounce at them, the golden lion roared at them, making the others freeze at the spot. The lions didn't make any noise after that as they headed out of a hole in the wall of the dome structure. Broly and the others hadn't seen it as they had approached the building from the other side. I thought I had eaten the remaining ones of your kind thousands of years ago. Well, a few kids had escaped back then, but I couldn't bother with that skinny prey. The lion said facing Broly while the other lions backed out, not giving Broly and crew a glance anymore. My kind, Broly asked. Did the lion mean the ancient civilization and mistook Broly's group with them? Well, they didn't have tails like you do, but besides that they looked identical to you and were very tasty, though most had not much meat on them. Now Broly was interested and since some escaped, maybe they were still around. What happened to them? Are there still more left? Broly asked, seemingly unconcerned that the lion casually spoke about eating humanoid creatures or rather humans according to his description. There was a small area in the outskirts that they had occupied shortly, but they tried to hunt down a deer. They seemed to rely on some kind of metal sticks which spewed out fire, but they suffered heavy damages by the deer. A corpse was washed deeper into the forests and through it. Almost all became aware of this delicacy. There was another group that stayed here longer before them. A woman with weird magic had led them, but I hunted her down personally after she tried to control me. A few had escaped, but I doubt that there are any left though. The others in Narn wouldn't let go of a tasty meal. I see. It doesn't seem like we are welcome on this land. 
Broly smiled bitterly as he heard that there had been quite a few humanoids that had wandered around here. Don't you want to have a bite of us? Broly asked the golden lion that had already turned around and headed for the outside. After being asked that the lion stopped and looked back at Broly. You are already deep in the forest and according to your scent, you already have been here for a few days. I smell the scent of blood of all kinds of creatures on the hands of the ones waiting outside. You didn't cower after being approached by me and I can feel the aura of a king on you. Your being puts me under pressure, even though you don't try to intimidate me, it is just the way you are. I doubt I would win against you. With this message he turned around again and started walking to the outside. We may meet in the future once again. My name is Aslan. Remember, only the strong rule here on Narn and the deeper you go, the stronger your enemies will get. His words lingered around even after he had left for a while. Broly rubbed his chin as he thought that the name was somewhat familiar, but he quickly put that thought into the back of his head. Go get the others and tell them to prepare some defenses. It seems like they won't have to fight anymore. All right. The others nodded and moved out to give out tasks. They weren't concerned that the lions would sneak attack them. The opposite was true. These lions would make good experience for the elites and with this building as a defense, they were confident that the elites would be able to fight everything off even without their help. A pride of lions with an intelligent leader at the front, a frightening idea for most and a very good variety to the dumb beasts that they usually encountered, but it was also the fact that their leader was intelligent that Broly thought that it was unlikely for them to try and attack them now. Broly started inspecting the ruins of this observatory and the building attached to it. He saw some markings on the walls that were already mostly corroded. Besides that, there was nothing left that could indicate on the culture or the technology of the ancient civilization and after listening to Aslan, he doubted that the humanoids he had encountered belonged to that civilization. How could they have been around only a few thousand years ago? These ruins felt like they were vastly older than mere thousands of years ago. Even if Broly used his whole strength when he is at his peak, he might not be able to damage the ruins significantly, but they still look like they fall apart at any moment. It was incredible tough but hardly any heavier than regular stone. Broly returned dissatisfied after he didn't find anything. He found himself an elevated position and got himself some sleep. A few hours later when the nebula started brightening again, Broly woke up and looked over to the guards. Nothing seemed to have tried to attack them that night as Broly didn't saw a beast's corpse. It might be the fact that they were currently residing in the lion's den. Broly merely nodded to the guard and got up. It was time to leave and head deeper into the forest. The others had already prepared to move out and Broly only needed to announce their departure and they were ready to go. Like the days before they walked towards the direction from where Broly felt the connection coming from. They walked and after a few hours, they saw the lions again, eating away at a few bears' copses. Aslan wasn't among the other lions. The two groups only acknowledged the other's existence and didn't provoke each other. The exhaustions threaded deeper into the forests and the beasts became more powerful. Broly even needed to adjust the difficulty of his training so they would survive. After a few hours of walking, another scion had broken through and turned into a super scion. With this addition Broly was able to send out another group to engage the beasts. Fortunately or unfortunately for the exhaustions, the frequencies of the attacks became higher, making the training even more resourceful but also vastly more dangerous. Broly first thought that with the increasing strength of the beasts, they would see less, but not only did the beasts become stronger but higher in numbers as well. After slaughtering their way through, they encountered a large group of white tigers. Broly instantly recognized that the female leader seemed to be intelligent and maybe capable of communicating like Aslan, but they didn't stick around for a chat and retreated after being discovered by Broly's group. Broly didn't pursue them. Aslan also said that he hadn't spoken with someone for a long time, so the tiger might not even be capable of speech. It would be meaningless for them to chase after them. They could only head deeper and after a few hours they encountered another ruin. This time it was a complex with three intact floors. They quickly occupied it and searched for any beasts. After killing a few giant spiders and snakes, Broly started teaching the new Super Saiyan the basics and his future training regime. For the next few days the exhaustions went deeper into the forests. At one point the flora started glowing in a blue shimmer, there were floating land pieces and all kinds of creatures. There were malicious tray ants that lured a group of scions with their fruits and humanoid tree-like creatures that were glowing green and commanding different animals to attack the scions. Fortunately, Broly and the other super scions were able to rescue the elites out of numerous difficulties, and with the elves they never ran out of water or places to stay. They could sense running water and easily find caves for them to stay the night. Usually those were homes of vicious beasts, 
but they were always able to defeat them. A few were unluckier and lost an arm or a leg, but no one until now died, which was a proof that their title as elites wasn't just for show. After all, almost all beings were comparable or stronger than they were. Of course, if they were stranded without a super scion as a support, they would have suffered far more casualties, especially early on before the first would be able to transform. At this point, Broly had already noticed the ones that were standing out in this group of elites. Most of them were able to become an elite because they had high power levels and high potential. Now the very best of them were coming into the limelight. Broly estimated that if they stayed here for another week or two, there would be at least three to seven additional super scions. Indeed, in the near future of this 50 plus scions, only three to seven would transcend. The others had potential as well otherwise they wouldn't be called elites, but Broly knew they would need a few months to develop under the right circumstances, which in retrospective of science history was impressive enough. After a week since they arrived on this island, they had headed deeper into the forest while being on constant alert of the numerous ambushes of mighty beasts. While they were walking, they suddenly heard a roar coming from a few kilometers away. Broly heard an elephant's trumpeting coming with it. Broly usually wouldn't bother with the fights among beasts, but he felt that the trumpet sound was affecting his emotions. The sound seemed to have magic imbued in it, making anyone that heard the trumpeting fearful. Might as well take a look. With that, Broly had to walk towards the battle sounds. The pressure on Broly's body hadn't lessened at all since he was on the island. If anything, it got stronger as time went on. Broly first thought it was because they had moved deeper into the island, but even through the night, the pressure grew. Broly didn't take long to figure out the reason. The pressure had indeed limited his powers, but under the constant pressure, his body and his energies got stronger, tougher, and more refined. It was not very different to a gravity chamber, only that it affected his key, magic, and life force as well. Broly, of course, was happy to make that discovery. As long as his body could improve, the pressure would get stronger as well. It would make an ideal training ground. The only downside was that he couldn't increase the pressure manually to make the best out of a training session. There was also the nature of the pressure as its main focus is suppressing Broly's power and not to put his body under stress. After walking for a while, they arrived. Broly saw a group of mammoths facing off a monstrous black dragon. The dragon was unlike Shenlong but had more characteristics of a western dragon. For powerful arms with intimidating claws and two wide wings that were creating whirlwinds with every flap. The scales on his back were forming sharp spikes and its two long horns on its head made it look devilish. The dragon was spewing out a wave of purple lighting arcs that scorched the fur and instantly paralyzed several mammoths under attack. There were eight adult mammoths protecting a few children in the middle. Beside them was a corpse of a younger dragon that had numerous holes in its side and a corpse of a calf with biting marks was not far away. It seemed like the young dragon tried to prey on the calf but died under the attacks of the adult mammoths. Broly's intention at first was only to take a look. He didn't want to interfere but after seeing the dragon fly freely in the air, he came to quick decision. Broly's soul enveloped his body and he immediately vanished from the spot. The other Exaustions wanted to help at first but they were shut down by the other leaders. They understood that Broly wasn't out to kill it. Broly appeared directly in front of the dragon's face. It was shocked at the sudden appearance, but it quickly reacted and opened its jaw. Darkness filled its mouth and Broly could feel the powerful presence of magic, but Broly was a step ahead of the dragon. He outstretched his hand and with a key shockwave, the dragon was knocked to the ground without being able to resist. It formed a long and wide trench on the ground as the wings were still wide open. Broly followed up without giving the dragon any rest. Broly appeared above the dragon and pressed his hand onto its forehead, pressing its head into the ground. The dragon directly fainted as a result. The mammoths saw all this happen and fearfully stepped backwards. Seeing that Broly didn't move towards them, they quickly retreated into the forest. Broly didn't bother to give them a chase. He told the other scions to carry the dragon. Broly started walking towards the source of the connection while the Scions dragged the dragon with them. Kalan, that was the name of the dragon and the only thing Broly could get out of its mind. A few hours later, Broly stood at the edge of a steep cliff. Broly let his eyes wander across the cliff and its edge. They were at the boundary of a humongous abyss. The abyss had a consistent colorful fog stretching across, giving no one the chance to see the ground. In the far distant horizon, Broly saw that the trees of the forests were following the boundary in a slight curve. Broly was astonished as he couldn't see the end of this abyss. From his view, he also could see that the walls of the edge were perfectly smooth, not something nature would give birth to. Broly felt magical and spiritual energy tickling his arms after he stretched it over the edge. 
Broly leaned over the edge and threw Dunn a three-meter-wide boulder he had picked up from the side into the abyss. Everyone was quiet, they didn't even breath, so they could hear the stone's impact. But even after 20 minutes, nothing could be heard. Kalan, come here. After saying that, the black dragon nosedived through the air directly towards Broly's side. With a mighty flap, the dragon stopped near Broly and descended next to him. Broly gave him a glance and saw that he was looking fearfully into the abyss. Go down there. The dragon vehemently shook his head after hearing Broly's words. It seemed to dread whatever was down there. Broly raised an eyebrow as he looked coldly at the dragon. That wasn't something you can reject. Go down. Even the science felt chilly when Broly was speaking. The dragon was trembling heavily, but it slowly approached the edge. The dragon looked down the edge for a moment before jumping high into the air. His wings were flapping furiously, but it barely had any effect as he plummeted to the ground. Kalan quickly turned around and tried to slow himself down at the walls, but his claws couldn't pierce into the stone, and he fell into the depths of the abyss like the stone before him. Broly frowned as he watched the dragon fall through the fog. The soul connection to the dragon had dimmed severely, like a veil covering his eyes. Fortunately, it wasn't completely severed. Broly only had to wait shortly until he noticed that the dragon had stopped descending after approximately two minutes of falling. Broly still waited for a few dozens of minutes, but even then, the dragon didn't die. He also was kind of aware what awaited him down there. All right, we are going down, Broly said and directly jumped off the edge and rapidly plummeted downwards. Broly fell through the fog for a few seconds. Nothing but colors could be seen through the naked eyes and since Broly's vision of truth was being blocked by it, he couldn't see anything differently than others. It took a few seconds to pass through the fog and once he was, a huge city was laid out in front of his eyes. Numerous skyscrapers that looked like they were made out of marble filled the area. It felt like he entered a holy city in the clouds. The ground on which the foundation was built on was so distant that Broly thought he had entered the stratosphere of a planet. The skyscrapers were kilometers long. It was an unbelievable sight. Broly continued to fall through the sky and tried to memorize the structure of this piece of land. There weren't only skyscrapers, but trees that were as huge as the buildings with forests surrounding it were scattered across the area. He also saw a giant desert in the distance and large oceans. It was an enormous autonomous ecology on a planetary level only on a singular plane. One could only describe it as a flat planet. A few thousand kilometers away, he saw a large circular area that seemed to be devoid of any buildings or trees with something in the middle, but it was too far away to see. One had to know that Broly's sight was incomparable to most beings in the universe and approached the level of the impossible. He could easily notice a figure that was thousands of kilometers away with just a glance and that was without his other senses or his vision of truth and here he couldn't even see the end of it. Fairly, the distance seemed to be shrouded in fog as well, but it still was a testimony of the vastness of this place. Although it was far away, Broly could still feel that the connection he was feeling was coming from there. Broly looked into the sky and saw a few figures following him, but instead of the colorful fog, a blue sky with a sun could be seen stretching across behind them. Broly would have never imagined that what he was seeing wasn't a normal sky with warmth from a star but a magical fog shrouding the whole place. That is if he wasn't transported the moment, he entered the fog. However, Broly was pretty sure that he wasn't off or somewhere else on the island, since he had felt the location of the dragon through their connection. If he hadn't thrown the dragon into the abyss, he might have really thought that he wasn't on the island anymore, but somewhere on an Earth-like planet. His powers were still being suppressed, nothing had changed in that regard. For a few minutes, they just fell to the ground with nothing to stop them. Of course, even if they fell longer at one point, they stopped increasing in velocity and the impact with that falling speed on a normal planet wouldn't be deadly for most Scions. This was especially true for the people here that were vastly stronger than the former Scions. But there was one thing Broly wasn't sure about. He looked at the ground and saw that it seemed to be made out of the same material that were used for the buildings around them. If the ground was the same, it would mean it was as hard as the buildings. Now falling at this speed on normal stone would cushion the fall a bit, but if they fell on something near indestructible, it would certainly be fatal. Fortunately for this group was that as long as Broly used his soul to envelop his body he could fly. Broly and the group were quickly approaching the ground. He saw the place that the dragon landed on was halfway on the road and halfway on what seemed to be a small park. The ground on in the park seemed to be normal ground so Broly turned around. Land in the park! Broly shouted and then slightly tilted his body to navigate through the air to avoid the road. The park was a few kilometers long but still small compared to the giant buildings around it. 
The others followed his command and headed for the park at staggering speeds. Like meteors, they all rained down on this little piece of nature in the city. The ground was instantly upheaved and broke into pieces. The ground was being pushed out of the confines of the boundaries that had separated the park from the road. Broly didn't use his soul to slow him down as he needed his soul to be in the best shape possible. He would refrain from using it. His body, however, could be broken and then healed again. A bit of physical pain hadn't disturbed Broly for a long time. The shock that went through his body as he landed shook every corner inside and outside. After landing and calming down, he pushed off the debris and stepped outside of his crater. He looked around and saw a few unlucky ones groaning as their limps were bent in a weird angle. Broly said that they would rest for a while before moving on again and then went to the dragon that was whining not far from them. Broly saw that his hind legs were broken and a part of his wing was folded. Broly threw a healing capsule at his face. The dragon received Broly's intention and directly opened his mouth and swallowed it whole. His body was being healed at a visible rate. After being healed, Kalan jumped up and licked Broly's face with its gigantic tongue. Broly's face was completely drenched. He looked at the dragon that was happily watching him as if he expected praise for his brave jump. Broly didn't know if he wanted to cry or laugh at the ferocious, devilish-looking dragon that stared at him with puppy eyes. How old are you? Broly wondered as he looked at the childish behavior. An almost unnoticeable buzz suddenly sounded out. Broly tried to listen at it more carefully and then, a few decades. A young, immature voice sounded out. This answer suddenly appeared through their connection. He was astonished as the soul connection was basically him placing a hidden door into someone else's mind to control, read or put thoughts or feelings into their mind, but a reverse communication shouldn't be possible. Can you use magic? The dragon nodded at the question and turned his head towards a building at the side. Kalan opened his mouth and breathed out a black flame that seemed to not burn but devour everything it touched. But against the building's material it showed no effect except for a small crack. Broly was flabbergasted. Did the dragon just crack this building that stood here for millions of years with a simple breath? Maybe that was why Kalan wanted to use that attack against Broly. Could even threaten Broly if he was hit by it. Broly looked at the dragon. The hidden door Broly placed into the soul of others used magic and his own soul energy. Maybe if a master of magic came into contact with it, he could manipulate it in a way to send messages. Previously, he had to will himself to read their minds, which wasn't exactly taxing, but now he could leisurely receive messages. Of course, if the dragon could just talk or communicate telepathically, it would be even better. This would be useful to communicate across the universe, but Broly doubted that everyone could use his hidden door that way. Judging according to the attacks, he suspected that the dragon had an unbelievable high affinity with magic, which helped it recognize the minuscule magic waves that the hidden door made. However, Broly wasn't concerned about the fact that the dragon had quickly found this secret door and was able to send messages. It was impossible for the dragon to have any effect on Broly's soul, as it was a one-way connection. The only thing it could do was erase the mark on its soul, but Broly was well aware of the consequences of having one soul damaged. Broly would just erase the dragon the moment it touched it or showed signs of wanting to remove it. Although he thought that, he was unconsciously petting its head. He watched the dragon that had its tongue out and was panting slightly. Broly felt like he was staring at a gigantic dog that was happy to see him. He even could imagine that the dragon was wagging its tail. Wait, he is wagging his tail. Broly only shook his head. He knew farewell to not easily judge someone. Time would tell if the dragon was trustworthy. Broly decided to ask it a few questions, and a young boy's voice responded eagerly. According to the description of Kulan, he and his younger brother had sneaked out of their parents' caves and hunted some animals. They encountered a young mammoth but didn't see the group of mammoths that were strong enough to be their contenders. His younger brother was caught in surprise and killed after being charged by several adult mammoths. Seemingly, Kalan was considered a child. Broly took a closer look at the dragon, but in no way would Kalan seem like a child. It was a few tens of meters long. For damn's sake, after resting for a while, the scions were ready to move out. When they were high in the air, they hadn't noticed that the buildings were completely empty. Broly first had hoped that they might find something, but it seemed like they would have to continue with empty-handed. Although the fundamental structure was slightly cracked, it looked like it would remain for millions of years to come. Without bothering to go into the hundreds of different buildings, they continued on with their journey. They had enough supplies to sustain themselves for another two weeks, so they wouldn't have to worry about it in the city. 
If they were able to fly, they would have crossed it in a few hours, but since they were bounded to the ground, it would take them a while. Fortunately, with the speed that they considered speed walking, they were swiftly crossing the city in a few days. Considering the distance towards their destination that they were able to grasp when they were falling towards the ground, it would take them at least another week if there weren't any accidents on the way. In the city, besides the trees that were manually planted, there was nothing of interest. The city was like a ghost town. It was a weird sight as there weren't any indication of a big fight that would have eradicated the population in the city. Of course, considering the toughness of the material it would be difficult to damage it, but if something was able to eradicate a race that had such formidable defenses, it would at least need to have enough destructive power to do so, right? But then why aren't there any damages? It was more plausible that the city was abandoned, but what could have made them leave? Obviously, even if they pondered more about it, they wouldn't be able to come up with the correct answer. They could only speculate. After three days, they had crossed the ghost city and finally arrived the borders of it. Unlucky for them, they had to cross a desert next. As soon as they stepped into the desert, the temperature rose and it got hotter the deeper, they went into the desert. In the desert, Kalan was somewhat able to fly again. Broly rode on his back and they quickly ascended into the sky and surveyed as much as they could. They saw what appeared to be an entrance a few hours away. Kalan suddenly mentioned that he couldn't ascend or stay in the air anymore. He was being dragged to the ground again and could only glide. Too bad. Broly had thought about using the dragon as transportation to bring them across the desert. Now that didn't seem possible anymore. It didn't make much sense as they were about the same speed if the dragon only glided. They had walked for a few hours inside the desert and arrived at a sandstone temple-like door. Kalan wasn't nearly as exhausted as the others. He said that he would sometimes bath in lava, so the temperature in the desert was nothing for him. It was, however, difficult for him to walk long distances. So, rather than walk, he would jump into the air and glided alongside them. The Exhaustions were happy to see the temple. They would be able to cool themselves off inside. Broly decided that they would stay for the night there as they hadn't found something similar in the near distance. With the increased temperature, their consumption of water increased but it would be fine as long as they were able to cross the desert in a week. Broly was sure that it would be enough time to cross it as the desert didn't seem as big as the city. The S-Fighter were the first to approach the temple. From the outside, they could only see the big entrance door and the rest was buried into the sand. With a kick, Broly forced the door open. The two halves were flung against the side walls and were stopped with a bang. The temple shook and sand was falling from the ceiling. Broly stepped inside and immediately felt the chilly air, as if the inside was completely undisturbed by the scorching heat outside. As soon as the S-Fighters stepped inside, the door shut again. The elites outside banged against the door, but it didn't look like they would be able to open it again. The S-Fighter also tried to pull it open from the inside, but they weren't able to budge it at all. Suddenly, light appeared from two torches on the sides and like a trigger more torches in a row on the walls were being lit, brightening the long tunnel in front of them. The torches were being held by two-meter-tall sandstone statues of knights that were carrying a sword in their free hand. The atmosphere felt ominous and the S-Fighters were looking warily at the surroundings and especially at the statues at the walls, waiting for an ambush. From time to time, a faint wailing resounded out of the stone statues. After a few tens of seconds of nothing happening, they realized that Broly was already walking deep into the tunnel. They quickly caught up to him. Shouldn't we try to get out? Taro asked Broly, who seemed undisturbed by the strange happenings and their entrapment. Broly only glanced at him. I said we are going to stay here. It doesn't matter what awaits us inside. I am not sleeping outside in the sand. Since you couldn't open it with force and it closed on its own, there has to be mechanism. We are going to clear this temple and then somehow open the door again. Without saying anything further, Broly kept walking for a few minutes until they arrived at a big hall with a centaur in the middle. To be exact, a stone statue of a centaur. It wielded a long lance in one hand and a shield in the other. Broly looked around and saw nothing but pictures carved into the wall. It depicted an epic battle of several centaurs against a small group of what appeared to be humans. Strangely, the scenery wasn't a desert but a forest. There were even giants intervening into the fight as well. While the S-Fighters spread out, the temple started to rumble and bars dropped from the entrance ceiling, blocking their way into the long tunnel. The statues in the tunnel suddenly moved in front of the closed gate. The tunnel was three meters wide so the statues could stand side by side. It seemed like they were waiting for the gate to open. The centaur in the middle of the hall started moving as well. It pointed its lance at Broly, and the shield was protecting his side. 
Broly turned his attention towards the centaur who was galloping towards Broly. It reached an incredible speed after a short distance. Of course, it wasn't much in Broly's eyes. However, what was strange was the fact that the centaur wasn't touching the ground as it moved. Broly also felt an incredible amount of magic power coming from the centaur, but it was somewhat different to the magic power he was used to. Felt purer. Before the centaur could reach Broly, Aaliyah came in with a flying kick, knocking the centaur into the walls. The centaur used the wall to slow himself down with its leg as its body rose up vertically. It then started galloping on the walls like it was the ground, completely defying gravity. It changed its attention towards Aaliyah, but Taro appeared in front of it and punched it hard. They were currently in their ascended super scion form and were vastly stronger than the centaur. Unfortunately, the centaur didn't feel pain and was made out of the same material that the temple was made. It wasn't far off to call the centaur indestructible. They used all kinds of attacks and it only ever slightly cracked it. Even worse, it started healing as it integrated the stone wall into itself. Broly's eyes flashed for a second and instantly disappeared. He arrived in front of the centaur and slapped the living shit out of the centaur. Broly's hand was glowing brightly, and as soon as it touched the centaur's face, his head was blown away like brittle stone. In the next moment, the centaur was reconstructed in its original position and the gate opened. The knights waiting with the torches and swords in hand started storming inside the hall. Broly, however, was one step ahead of them. His body turned into a green blur as he crashed directly into the first statures that were flooding inside. Broly didn't stop as he just crushed through the dozens of statures until he arrived at the gate again and the knights crumbled apart. After the last knight fell, the gate opened again, and the knights were reconstructed in their original position. As soon as the outside world was once again revealed to them, they saw how their elites were defending against four large black scorpions. Each of them was several meters tall. Their stinger was dripping with vicious black liquid that instantly corroded the sand beneath them. The tail of the scorpion whipped towards the exhaustions at incredible speed. Lutch and Sabi, the other super scion, were at the forefront in defending against the beasts, but they couldn't prevent the scorpions from grazing a scion from time to time. Kalan was fighting one-on-one -on -one with a scorpion and they seemed to be evenly matched but only Broly and he knew that he wasn't actually trying and was only holding the scorpion back. The venom with each sting was paralyzing and quickly killing the scions. But fortunately the other races were functioning as medics and quickly pulled out the unfortunate ones out to heal them. With that, they were able to prevent any casualties but a single healing capsules were only able to offset the venom. Their numbers of people capable of battling were rapidly dwindling. After the days in the forests their teamwork was impeccable. Even though the enemy's attacks were vicious, they were able to hold their own. The S-Fighters weren't trying to assist them and just watched the battle unfold. Broly coldly looked around the battle stage. He had already anticipated an attack once they, the strongest, moved inside the temple. In fact, he had already noticed that something was following them for a long time. The others were aware of it too and had discussed it with Broly telepathically. Now they had lured them out, why didn't they attack? Broly knew that they were desperate for help, but he also knew that this was a perfect opportunity for the elites. So, even though they were already out, due to the fierce fight no one had noticed something after they had closed the temple's door again. The exhaustions were being pushed back with every clash. It was clear that the battle would tilt for the scorpions any moment. If they had fought in the forests, these beasts weren't a problem. Unfortunately, they were in the desert. The exhaustion speed on the ground was significantly slower with the same effort while the scorpions were undisturbed. Not only were they undisturbed by the ground, they could dive into it like it was water, which made the fight several times more difficult than it already was. It got even worse as Lutch was grazed by the stinger and quickly lost a lot of strength as he had to fight off the venom with his key. Suddenly another scorpion sprung out of the ground that was 10 meters tall and was blood red. It directly bounced towards Lutch who was weakened. Seeing this two scions that were covering for Lutch intervened. One of them blasted a key blast at the stinger and made it miss Lutch's head by a few centimeters the other scion stepped in and grabbed the snapping claws. Seeing that the scorpion focused on ending the one in his way first. The scion was rapidly pushed back as it held onto the claws. In the back was a huge sand hill and the scion knew that as soon as they reached it, he would be pressed into the sand with nowhere to retreat. Even now he was being pushed into the ground and was only able to hold himself above the ground by backtracking. In the struggle, the scion's aura was blinking golden until it turned into a golden flame. He looked like a divine aura fighting a beast straight out of hell but even with this newfound power he was no match for the scorpion strength-wise. Only a moment later a blur rammed the scorpion in the sides, 
but it wasn't enough to push it further than two meters until the Red Scorpion found his balance again. The blur was the scion that had saved Lutch with his key blasts. After giving Lutch a healing capsule, he quickly came to the rescue to the awakened Super Scion that was threatened to be torn into pieces. Having effectively gained the attention of the Scorpion, he was being slapped away by the tail. He fell heavily onto the sand but kept his focus sharp. He saw how a blur headed straight for his head and in a desperate attempt he tried to catch it. As his arms moved towards the blur his eyes turned green and his hair golden. Against all odds he was able to catch the stinger just in front of his face. His golden glowing hands slowly turned black from touching the venom. The liquid dripped on his chest, corroding right through his armor. One could hear the sizzling sound of his key trying to burn it all away. The scion was losing his strength in his poisoned arms and the sting was moving closer to his face. Luckily the scion he had saved came in for his rescue and let him retreat to heal himself. The other scorpions were constantly pushing the exhaustions into a corner, but their counterattacks were just as fierce. Unbeknownst to the elite Zhongya had her hand outstretched, pointing at the red scorpion. No one was able to see the thin threads that were entrapping every limp around the scorpion. Even the scorpion was unaware of it, but it still lost tremendous amount of strength from time to time. Broly had told her and the others that they weren't intervening with this fight and would let them handle it. Of course, he wouldn't want them to die. So he waited for the leader of the scorpions to come out and let Zongya help them from the shadows. He wanted them to not depend on the other super scions all the time. Even the fact that they knew that they were nearby had gave them the sense of a safety net in the past. Now with them seemingly trapped inside the temple, they had to go all the way with no one in sight of possible help. They had to rely on themselves and on themselves alone. Well, that was how they perceived it anyway. Numerous healing capsules were being used, and although they had all started with 20 plus each when they arrived on this island, their numbers were now decreasing rapidly. Before they ran out completely, Broly and the others moved out and helped the Exhaustions clear the Scorpions. Broly was satisfied with the result. The two Scions that helped Lutch and another woman that was fending of a Scorpion on her own after no one was able to fight any more turned Super Scion. They had Lutch, Sabi who turned after Lutch and now they had three additions. More, Fel and Anna. Broly quickly assigned them a group and led them inside the temple. The statues didn't start moving again but the torches were still lit. They moved inside the hall and spent the night there. In the next morning, they had recovered from the fight the day before. Fortunately, no one had lost any limps and though they were severely poisoned, they were able to heal themselves with their medicine. They didn't need to build prosthesis which was a relief as they were still in the middle of a desert and had no access to wood. They started walking again for hours and at one point Broly ascended with Kulan into the air and searched for another place to stay. Broly frowned slightly as he now saw another temple not far away and several more in the distance. He looked around and saw numerous of these temple gates scattered around in the desert. At least we won't be sleeping outside. With that, they headed for another temple. Like before the S-Fighters moved inside first while the other elites were guarding outside. With a total of five super scions, they were capable of fending off most threats alone. Everything inside was exactly built the same with the knights at the side holding torches in their hands. The only differences were that the knights didn't have legs but a long tail of a snake. They wore scale like armor. Broly squinted his eyes as he remembered the knights in the first temple. Their legs were slightly bigger than on a normal human that size. It looked more like they had hooves and horns on their head. He had first thought that it was just the design of the knight's armor but considering that they were completely made out of stone, those things weren't supposed to look like armors to begin with but maybe represented creatures that looked like that. The only thing that came close to the representation of those knights were satyrs and those knights now looked like lamias or nagas. Broly couldn't be sure as he never saw those creatures and only roughly knew them through mythological stories. After inspecting the knights, he headed deeper into the hall. The other S-Fighters seemed to notice that Broly had figured something out but now wasn't the time to ask. Broly squinted his eyes as he looked at the creature in the middle of the hall. A statue that was depicting a beautiful woman with a long snake tail. Each of her hair strands represented a different snake. As soon as they entered, a gate fell down and closed their path outside. The woman moved and she looked at Broly and company. Her eyes started glowing with an ominous light. Medusa? Broly thought as he looked at the woman. Don't look at her eyes or you will turn into stone. Broly shouted after realizing who it was. Without hesitation, the others looked away while spreading into the hall. Broly sensed something and directly dodged to the side. When he looked back at the spot where he just stood, he saw another layer of stone covering the ground. 
She doesn't need to be seen. Broly dodged again and saw how Medusa clawed at him, only missing by a short distance. A key blast hit her in the face. The explosion enveloped her body. Suddenly wings on her back dispersed the smoke with a single flap. She soared into the air towards Taro who just attacked her. Broly's body glowed slightly and he pursued her. She couldn't even react to his movement before he tore out her wings and kicked her into the wall, following up immediately with a chop at her neck. His hand was like a sword as it effortlessly sliced thought her neck. Her head flew into the air before it flew to its original position as sand flying through the air. The gate opened and the knights rushed inside. Broly quickly approached the entrance and finished several knights with a single strike. His leg kicked out like a whip, decimating his opponents. There was no suspense. The knights rushed in and were instantly killed by every strike of Broly. After a minute or two, every knight was disposed of and Broly was able to relax again. Aaliyah approached him with concern written on her face. Are you okay? They knew that Broly's soul was damaged and every use would delay his healing. But now he engaged in a fight twice in two days. They wanted to fight for him, which was the reason why they went inside with him to begin with. Yeah. It seems like I am approving with ever-fallen statue. He hadn't noticed it before as he had to concentrate on keeping the Exaugeons alive as they had fought against the Scorpions. But now it was different. It was almost minuscule, but he could feel his soul being strengthened. He would have missed it if he wasn't as sensitive as he was. Besides, if his vision of truth wasn't limited, he would have seen energy leaving the statue's bodies and traveling through the ground towards his feet. Broly put his thoughts back and looked at the pictures on the wall which seemed to depict her life until she was killed by Perseus who was armed with a sickle and a shield. There wasn't a name tag on the walls but that was who Broly remembered that killed Medusa. After going through the pictures, they went out and started to build defenses for the night. They just took the sand to build small hills to surround the entrance. Although it didn't offer much help against creatures that were traversing in the underground, it was better than nothing. It was unfortunate, but they weren't able to use magic to materialize a few materials. It didn't really matter anyway as they would retreat into the tunnel to fight it out if someone was coming after them. The next few days they were attacked by some other beasts that looked like humanoid wolves, but they didn't seem intelligent at all. Five meter tall tarantulas had obstructed their way several times. There were also gigantic sandworms that could have swallowed the whole group in a second, but it seemed like they weren't preying on them but on the giant spiders. Broly watched interested as the giant worms and the tarantulas fought it out with each other. The worms had a clear advantage as they were moving through the sand undisturbed. It looked even more effortless than the scorpions. The hairy spiders were quickly devoured, and the worms disappeared in the depths of the sand. Although this was interesting to watch, Broly became more interested in the temples themselves. Beforehand he just saw them as a convenience to not sleep outside, but now he saw things that he didn't expect to see different mythologies that he knew from his past life, but it wasn't stopping there. Movies, series, and books, there were several famous characters that Broly could identify. Of course, there were some he didn't know, but Broly was quite interested in what else he would be able to see. He even went as far and took Kalan for a fly in the night. Of course, it wasn't only because he wanted to sightsee, but he also benefited from defeating the statues. It didn't heal his soul, but it was improving it. It was barely noticeable, and if he didn't go after the statues, he wouldn't have noticed the difference. At the fourth night, Broly arrived at a vast gate that was several times bigger than the three-meter-wide doors from before. Just as he wanted to enter the temple, he felt the buzzing. What is it? Broly asked and turned towards Kalan. I want to go inside with you. Broly saw the determination and anticipation in his eyes. He couldn't say no to the cute puppy face that Kalan was putting on. If someone else would know that Broly considered Kalan as cute, they would have asked if he was crazy instead. Kulan looked like a ferocious and sinister dragon that was born out of darkness itself. With his huge size, deadly claws and fangs, he struck fear into the hearts of mankind. To consider Kulan as cute in any way would only be able to come out of a devil's mouth. After giving his okay, they went inside the hall and Broly instantly noticed the difference to the other halls. The decoration and the used material always differentiated itself from each other a bit but now it felt familiar. The material seemed to be normal slightly darker stone and it was covered with moss. The knights looked like normal humans in full plate armor. They quickly arrived at the hall and a familiar situation happened. Their path of retreat was obstructed and in the middle of the hall the creature started moving. No, this time it was two creatures and the hall were tens of meters tall. A giant old dragon of the same kind as Kalan, only bigger was moving in the middle. 
Riding the dragon was a creature that had armor that seemed to be made out of dragon bones. He was armed with a sword and a shield. Broly couldn't believe his eyes. He was familiar with that getup and coupled with the dragon, he realized something. He saw the dragon raise his body and opened his mouth in preparation to release a mighty fire breath. Kalan was provoked by it and directly imitated it with a fire breath of his own. Broly was focusing on the man that opened his stony mouth and released a strange bluish magical shockwave. Broly waved his hand at the wave and directly cut it in two. The man pulled out his sword and jumped off the dragon's back. His body shot towards Broly and directly tried to cut him in half. Broly only smirked and took out the black sword that he was carrying on his back the whole time. He blocked the strike and sliced at the man who quickly put up his shield to block it. The man's body slid across the ground only stopping a few ten meters away. It was only a stone creature so it didn't feel any discomfort of the strike. It headed into battle straight away once again. Broly played around for a while as he barely had used the sword and thought it was a good opportunity to copy some movements of a real swordsman. Although it wasn't a real living being, the stone creatures moved like ones. The difference in skill in terms of the sword between the two was undeniable, but with every second this skill gap slowly shrunk. Broly had an absolute control over his body even if he didn't train in the way of the sword with conscious manipulation of every fiber of his body, he was able to copy the skills of this stone figure. It was clear that if he only watched the moves, he would have been able to copy them as well, but it wouldn't be the same. His muscles didn't have memories of the moves he did. The only thing that came close to it was when he used a keyblade. He wanted to refine his skill and see the difference in real time. However, annoyingly the man used several spell-like attacks that Broly had to dodge. They were powered by immense magic power and each of those attacks had different weird effects. Kalan quickly finished off his opponent and watched Broly going at it with the armored man. Broly fought on for a few minutes before he felt slightly fatigued and knew that if he continues not only would his healing be delayed but he might be hurt again. With a quick burst in speed and power, he shortly decapitated the man. The gate opened and before they could move in, a line on their chest appeared before they crumbled altogether. Broly strapped the sword back on his back and looked at the pictures that were describing the life of the man known as the Dragonborn. He was familiar with the story as he had played the game in the past, however, some parts weren't as he remembered it. Many key parts were the same but there were large differences. Giant battles, wars, and peculiar creatures and characters. After analyzing the pictures, his focus turned back to the stone figure. He hadn't put much thought about it before, but their movements are lifelike. Although they aren't acting injured if you pierce their legs, they are still depicting emotions like anger and pain. In some way, they seem to be mirrors of the beings that they are representing. Broly wanted to call out to Kalan, but he noticed something after he looked at Kalan. Stand there for a second. Broly pointed a few meters away in front of a large picture. Kalan seemed to know something as he put on the posture as if he was preparing a breath. Behind him was a picture of a dragon in the same posture. It was Alduin fighting the dragonborn. Though slightly different, the resemblance was there. Do you know anything about that dragon behind you? Broly asked Kalan. Of course. This is my dad. He had anticipated such an answer, but he was still stunned hearing this. Your dad is Alduin the World Eater? I don't know about World Eater, but his name is indeed Alduin. Kalan was full of pride as he talked about his father. He is the strongest in all Nier. Now Broly became confused as he listened to what Kalan was saying. Nier? Don't you mean Nern? What is Nern? I am talking about Nier, you know, Nier is Nier. Kalan started rambling about what Nier was. From what Broly could identify from the simple explanation Kalan gave, it was basically what they call everything in existence or this island to be precise. Aslan had called it Narn and the dragons call it Nier. Broly got suspicious as he thought about Aslan and the otherworldly feeling he gave off. Has Alduin ever told you stories about the past? Yes. Dad is telling me goodnight stories all the time. Kalan said happily. It was an insane concept to think about a vicious dragon that had a parent who read a bedtime story to it. Broly listened intently to what Kalan was saying and filtered out everything he could understand. The stories were basically the same to what Broly himself knew from the game, but it was also largely different. It was like the story was being passed on by many and then recounted through the perspective of Alduin. The perspective of the story was logical as Alduin was the one that told the story, but the differences were another thing. For example, Alduin wasn't confronted in Sovngarde, but somewhere in the mountains with several disciples of the Dragonborn, and there seemed to be canon as well. There were other things as well. It didn't sound like a medieval setting at all. Additionally, 
It all was supposed to have happened on this island. It was weird, but Broly didn't want to think about it anymore. He was already getting a headache because of Kalan's long way of retelling. It took Kalan almost three hours to recount a story of 20 minutes content. For the next two days, he still visited some temples to take a look. He thought that he may get other clues, but before he was able to get something out of his effort, they had traversed the desert. They finally got to the borders and had a snow landscape laid out in front of their view. It felt strange seeing the two extremes with a perfect line dividing them. Broly had already guessed that almost everything what they saw would be man-made. A blizzard seemed to be constantly going on, but they had no choice but to move on. Kalan was fine even in this area. It seemed like he wasn't only unaffected by hot, but to cold temperatures as well. The cold temperatures themselves weren't a problem for the science either, but to have their vision obstructed was bothersome. The other races seemed to be okay with the temperatures as well. Maybe they were putting up a front since Broly was here too. Broly himself wasn't concerned that they would freeze to death. One could still keep themselves warm with one's key. They walked for a few hours before they were attacked by giant polar bears that sprung out of the thick snow. Broly was happy about the sudden ambush as he didn't have to eat spider and scorpions anymore. He was already craving for a big slab of some meat. After the polar bear, big white Siberian tigers had tried to make them their prey. The exhaustions made short work out of these big kittens and proceeded onwards. After some time, Broly put Kalan at the forefront as it was deterring some creatures from attacking them. The snow area wasn't as big, but it had many mountains which would increase the time it would take to cross the distance. Broly felt an impulse as if he needed to reach his destination soon, so he wasn't in the mood to explore the area either. He could feel the connection getting stronger and he didn't want to waste more time on this island. Although he wanted to move faster, Broly was aware to accustom their traveling speed to their weakest member. For the next days, they didn't let themselves be distracted and focused only on traveling. The training they had put on at the beginning was also mostly put off. Only the last two scions that seemed to have the potential to reach Super Scion soon were allowed to train. The others only used their energy on traveling and putting up camps and such. Took them a while to get used to the new terrain. Their adaptivity, however, towards the environment was impressive to say the least. For the scions, Broly had accounted it towards their years of invading other planets and conquering them and the elves were already pushed to the brink of extinction and were forced to live in the extremes. As for the other races, some were naturally accustomed to cold weathers and some had a difficult time in these weathers. Fortunately, they all had experienced numerous different situations and were quickly able to able to take countermeasures. It took them four days to cross the snowy mountains until they reached a lush forest with enormous trees. This time the group was already used to the forest from before and instantly came back into a rhythm. Their speed increased once again. Broly had calmed down after the initial desire to increase their speed and told them to resume with their training. The beasts they had encountered were very similar to the ones above but only a lot stronger. The beasts they had encountered all the way since the desert had always gotten stronger the closer they got to their destination. It was obvious that this wasn't a coincidence, it was a pattern. Besides beasts, they encountered different creatures that seemed to be made out of elements. Most of them were made out of stone or water. There were some out of electricity or light. They all were very resilient to their key attacks. After they were blown into pieces, most of them would reconstruct themselves and start attacking again. The Exhaustions had to keep destroying them until they didn't. It somewhat reminded him of Bu who could regenerate from the tiniest number of cells. Broly wasn't even sure if they got rid of them completely after they didn't come back up. Fortunately, they weren't wandering around in groups and also didn't seem to be instinctively hostile. It was only because Broly told the Scions he wanted to evolve to provoke them. He had hoped that they might leave something behind but since they had to destroy them completely, they had to leave empty-handed. For another three days, they traveled through the forest until they reached a large deep pit in the ground devoid of anything but a smooth ground of marble. The ground wasn't made out of individual stones, but the whole area seemed to be made out of one single stone. In the middle of the pit far away was a giant white Greek temple with impressive pillars supporting the gigantic roof. The building was phenomenal. The size was unreal and intimidating. There was a taunting and otherworldly aura coming out of it. It was like the temple itself was looking down on him. Two gigantic 300-meter-tall statues were guarding the entrance. They looked like Roman warriors, a spear and a shield in hand, a large cape and a feathered helmet. Of course, the cape wasn't fluttering in the wind and the feathers weren't actual feathers. They were monumental statues made of solid stone. The statues were only half the size of the temple, but unlike the temple Broly felt like they were looking at him like he was a challenger. 
Broly was undisturbed by this, he would just smash them into pieces. He took the first step inside the spherical area. It was slightly inclined, leading towards the temple. The ground directly around the temple was even. It was quite obvious that a battle would be taken place there. Broly felt like he was about to face off a boss of a game. He still hadn't figured out why Salutis had brought him here, but he didn't bother thinking about it. He would know as soon as he went inside that temple. Taking a few steps, he realized something. He didn't hear footsteps following him. Broly turned around and saw that the others were hammering against an invisible barrier. Broly squinted his eyes. He hadn't felt anything even with his astute senses. He couldn't even hear them scream. In fact, he couldn't hear anything besides his own heartbeat. Going back through the barrier without a problem, he realized that only he could go through it. He told the others to wait for him here. They knew it was pointless to argue as they had already tried to enter, but they still asked him to wait for his soul to be healed. However, Broly told them it wouldn't be a problem to fight now. He knew it was an irrational thought as it would only take a few days to heal but every fiber of his body urged him towards the temple. He wouldn't be able to rest if he stopped now. He took some supplies just in case as there weren't any creatures on a way that he could eat. It would take him maybe six hours of walking until he reached his destination. He took a bag of supplies, the sword and the golden triangle with him. After walking for five and a half hours he had reached the even ground. With his experience in the temples Broly already suspected what would happen if he took a step on the even ground. So, before he did step inside, he rested for a moment and ate something so he could reach his current peak. Calming his agitated mind and adjusting his body, he got ready for the incoming battle. He knew that this fight would be incomparable to the other fights in the temples that he had before, especially considering that his super scion form was basically useless. He had walked through the night and now the sky in the air simulated a sunrise. The world brightened with the illusionary sun at the horizon. Broly stepped up after meditating for a few dozen minutes. He took some steps forward and then looked back and saw the outside getting clouded with gray ominous fog, but it still didn't get any darker because of it. Broly focused on the guards again that now had their heads turned towards Broly. Before he only felt that they were watching him but now actually seeing them turn their complete attention towards him was unsettling. They gave Broly a sense of pressure that he rarely felt from others. Of course, he had faced numerous strong enemies and this time it wouldn't be any different. He would have needed half an hour to walk towards them but Broly knew that he wouldn't be able to have a leisure walk towards the temple. His legs moved faster as he walked towards the giant intimidating statues. His body started to glow as he broke out in a full sprint. His body flashed towards the guards that took in a stance. Their bodies were covered with their shield and their spear was laid on top of it, pointing straight at Broly. Even after Broly reached his full speed, the spears were steadily following him. One of the guards stepped forward. He first walked but then started sprinting as well. With his 300 meter size, he closed in rapidly. Only a few hundred meters away, the guard thrusted out his spear. Despite the size of the spear, its speed was frightening. Broly, of course, saw the spear heading straight at him. The tip of the spear was as large as a building which shot towards him. The sheer size created a huge whirlwind that would have blasted most beings in the universe away. Obviously, this wasn't worth mentioning for Broly. What concerned him was that he couldn't estimate the threat level. He was confident in his strength even as suppressed as he was and since he needed to find out their level of threat, he dismissed the idea of dodging. He stomped the ground and propelled him directly to the tip of the spear. A spear of solid stone like materials with a length of over 300 meters versus a figure that was 2.2 meters tall. It looked like the statue was about to smash a fly into the ground that would only leave behind a smudge. However, the moment the two forces met a seemingly impossible scene was played out. It looked like the spear was being pushed backwards. The statue didn't miss its target, but his spear was blocked and pushed backwards. The guard's strength was actually inferior to Broly's. Broly held the meter's wide tip and pushed onwards. He could feel the struggle, but he only sneered at the effort. To think that he was actually feeling pressured by such a weak creature. He smashed the side of the spear and made it fly in an arc. The tip immediately cracked after being hit. Broly didn't hesitate to follow up. He shot towards the statue's face but since the guard was too big, it took him a second to reach it. On the way the guard wasn't inactive. Seeing the spear almost flung out of his hand he followed up with a shield bash, trying to swat Broly away. Broly noticed the movement of the shield and directly countered it. He accelerated his body and spun around creating a fierce tornado with a single spin until he kicked against the enormous shield. 
The tornado had followed around his leg as it smashed against the shield, directly stopping the shield in its path. Cracking noise sounded from the shield. After the wind dispersed a web of cracks spread from the point of contact. The former spotless shield was now ruined as it was riddled with cracks. The momentum of the kick had pushed the shield away and opened a path straight towards the guard's chest. Broly hadn't noticed it before as the shield always covered it, but a two-meter-tall black spot on the white chest revealed itself after the shield was out of the way. Broly didn't hesitate and dashed towards the spot like a lightning. The momentum still carried the guard's arms outwards and wasn't able to cover himself. Its only option was to tilt his body so Broly wouldn't be able to reach it, but it was too difficult for it to do so. The other guard had first watched the fight leisurely but after the first attack, its countenance changed. It decisively headed towards the two to assist his ally. Seeing the frantic expressions on the guard's face, he was almost certain that this spot was their source of life. Broly didn't give the guard a single chance to survive as his speed suddenly burst and instantly crashed into the black spot. The giant guard was lifted into the sky crashed against the other guard who came to assist him. Broly took the chance as the spear was being blocked by the guard's body to come in from the side. The other guard panicked and moved his shield to his chest to close the gap and prevent Broly from reaching it. But Broly was just flying too fast. In a fraction of a second, he already arrived at the spot and plunged his arms inside the spot and tore it apart. Broly's face had a nearly fanatically smile on his face as he felt the power of the black stones move inside his soul. The moment he had crashed inside the first black spot, he had felt a tremendous amount of energy rushing inside his soul and nourishing it. Broly didn't even need to guide it like he had to with the spirit crystal, but the energy was being absorbed on its own violation. Not only had it healed his soul but supplemented and strengthened it tremendously. His soul was even fixed from hidden deficiencies which seemed to have come from the time he had traveled across multiverses after he died. The second black spot had increased his strength as well, but the effect wasn't as exaggerated as the previous time. It seemed like absorbing the energy out of these black spots made extremely tolerant towards it. Either way, he was ecstatic as he felt his strengthened soul. He could probably power his whole body at maximum strength for half an hour without any difficulties. This meant that for half an hour coupled with his normal strength, he was able to contend against beings on godly level. He watched the giant statues fall to the ground and shatter into thousands of pieces. The ground itself was undamaged, as if it would remain that way for eternity. Broly didn't bother with the debris that once had guarded the temple. He was actually surprised that they weren't reconstructed again, but he didn't bother with it anymore and headed for the temple. The pillars gave off a godly feel like it supported the heavens themselves. Broly didn't give them a glance and headed straight past them. A giant golden door obstructed the way inside. Broly had to fly up and pull on the giant handle to open it. Unexpectedly, it opened as easy as a normal-sized door. Broly was sucked inside and was blinded for a second. The light dimmed slightly and revealed the inside of the temple. A giant hall that was at least 500 meters high was revealed to Broly. The pillars were meticulously decorated with a carved pattern. The sides were glowing as if he hadn't entered a room but was in the inside of a sun. The only thing that wasn't glowing brightly was the red carpet that was laid in the middle of the hall leading towards a small sun-like portal at the end of the hall. This whole room was very eye-catching and would be considered a sacred place by most, but all these didn't catch Broly's attention. The only thing that was in his focus were the two Roman-like warriors that seemed to be the life versions of the guards outside. Broly squinted as he felt the same pressure that he had originally felt from the statues outside. Broly looked at the lifelike guards that were in contrast to their statue counterparts a lot smaller. They were around for meters tall and didn't look like they were inanimate figures. In fact, Broly could feel some kind of life force being emitted by them. He approached them with slow steps. They weren't ordinary and the statues outside couldn't even come close to their power. Although the stone figures had the advantage of size, Broly doubted that they were stronger than these two in front of him in any way. He even suspected that the two had controlled the statues outside as they leaked the same pressure he previously felt. It wasn't as clear as it would be with sensing a key signature, but he got more certain the closer he got to those two. I assume you won't let me through so easily, right? Broly asked after he stopped 20 meters away from them. One guard gave the other guard a look before he turned his attention towards Broly once again. If it weren't for the colors of their cape and their feathered helmet, they would be nearly undistinguishable. One was donned with red, the other with blue color. The blue guard took several steps forwards before his body suddenly turned into a blur as he broke out in a sprint. Broly was barely able to react as he sensed the danger of the incoming spear that was aiming to pierce his skull. 
By tilting his head slightly, he effectively evaded the strike, but after dodging it, a shield bash followed up. Broly immediately crossed his arms and blocked the shield. He slid backwards across the red carpet. The choice of attacks and the way he held his spear, struck out and used his shield as a follow-up. Broly was sure that this person had controlled the statue outside. I guess that was a no. Broly mumbled as he observed the guard. He saw a rainbow-colored gem embedded in the armor of his chest, similar to the black spot of the statue. Broly wanted to counterattack, but before he could do so, he sensed another threat trying to claim his life. He abruptly leaned backwards until he was parallel to the ground. He saw a spear pass the area where his head had been just a moment ago, but this wasn't all. Broly pushed himself with one hand from the ground and decisively dodged to the side. A loud bang followed after he dodged. He saw that the spear had stopped just above him and then tried to hammer him into the ground. Unexpectedly, the other guard with the red cape and feathers had attacked right after the blue guard started his attack. Broly didn't think that he would intervene as he had interpreted the look of the blue guard that he wanted to fight alone. Of course, Broly wouldn't trust on his interpretation of these being in this place, so he always remained vigilant. The two guards stood side by side as they watched Broly's stance. Broly stood with open arms stretched out to the ground. His left foot was slightly in front of his right. Although he looked like he was wide open, every expert with a sense of danger would realize the deadly aura Broly was emitting. They would feel that Broly showed no signs of openings and anyone who would try to attack him now would be torn into pieces in an instant. The guards looked at each other again and then turned to Broly, but instead of attacking him, they balanced their spear on the ground before taking off their helmets. The blue guard had red hair and eyes that looked like they were burning fiercely with a thirst of action. The red guard had blue hair and eyes which gave off a calming aura. The red-haired one stepped forward and spoke in a heroic voice. You are a lot stronger than the previous challenger. Let's see if you succeed. The other only nodded at the comment, but besides that showed no signs of desire to talk as well. The red-haired one gripped his spear and turned his back towards Broly and started to walk to the sun-like portal with his ally walking by his side. Red noticed something and turned his head to look at Broly. What are you waiting for? Broly was of course stunned. He thought he had to fight to the death with them. How come they now want him to follow them? Was it a trap? What does he mean with challenger? His thoughts were running wild as he contemplated about the prospect of getting rid of them immediately. He knew that it would be a hard-fought battle, but he was sure that he could get rid of them. He hesitated first but then started to follow them. He somehow doubted that he could read their minds. Although they gave him a feeling of living beings, he was still unsure if they were. He was only able to read minds if he suppressed the consciousness of the target and make it unable to retaliate. He usually did this with soul attacks or by being immensely more powerful than his opponent. He wasn't a lot stronger than they were and he wasn't sure if their conscious was tied to a soul. How would he suppress them then? If he couldn't read their minds, he and the others would be doomed to wander around with no perspective of getting off this island. So, what is the next test? Broly tried to pry for some information as they walked through the sun portal. He was blinded for a second before the light faded again. His eyesight adjusted to the change of brightness. He saw a gigantic semicircular table in a huge room. Big seats that numbered 48 were placed around the table. Although every seat was empty, they still gave off a strange sense of liveliness like someone was sitting on it. At the open end of the table was another slightly elevated seat that resembled a throne. Between the throne and the semicircular table was a white circular pedestal with a giant sheath standing straight. Broly saw that it was vibrating slightly as if it was calling out for something. Suddenly, he felt the sword on his back getting warmer. It didn't take long until it got scorching hot and threatened to burn his armor. Broly unwrapped it, but still firmly held it in his hand. The Red Guard stated speaking after he observed Broly. Since your strength is satisfactory, you are allowed to try to convert. If you can complete it, you can control the island with the golden triangle you carry with you. As if on cue, the triangle flew out of Broly's pocket and stopped right above the palm of the red-haired guard. Broly's eyes widened. Control the island? What do you mean by control? The guard watched Broly in silence for a moment before he opened his mouth again. Think of the island as a spaceship and you would be the captain. After saying a simple sentence, he fell silent again. It seemed like he wasn't willing to reveal too much, but Broly had already guessed the capabilities of this island. They were currently in the abyss and the size of this area alone was comparable of that of a planet. It would be scaled to multiple planets if one considered the area around it. The Exaustions were here for a few weeks and with their speed they still haven't seen everything of it. 
It was not much different to think of it as a personal planet that he could move around as he wished. However, there was more to consider, especially after seeing the numerous mythological creatures in Alduin. It was practically certain that it had the ability to travel through multiverses. His thoughts were interrupted as the guard spoke again. Before you can convert, however, you have to acquire a sword on the Island of Trials. Broly listened to what he was saying, but he was puzzled. Do you mean this sword? The sword in his hand was practically burning. He was pretty sure that this was a sword meant for that sheath, wasn't it? This is the possession of the challenger before you named Salutis. Since he had failed to convert because of his lack of knowledge of the absorption techniques, he was sent back to where he came from. Broly wanted to ask the guard more questions, but before he could, he was sucked away by a vortex that appeared behind him. The surroundings changed drastically, and he found himself high in a blue sky. Below him were some clouds, but between the clouds wasn't any ground but never-ending blue sky. It seemed like he was on a floating island in some kind of alternate dimension. He turned away from the cliff and looked at the so-called Island of Trials. It was rather small and unimpressive. It was just a stony barren wasteland. Gray rock formations were filling up his view. It was barely a few kilometers in size. Broly jumped up and quickly scanned the surroundings for the sword or anything out of place. He wasn't sure what the trial would be, but if Salutis was able to get hold of a sword, he could achieve it as well. After roughly scanning the surroundings, he quickly found something out of place. It was himself holding a giant black sword similar to the one Salutis was wielding. As soon as he spotted that fake Broly, he was spotted as well. Without waiting, he shot towards him. He knew where the sword is, he only needed to take it from that fake Broly. Broly felt life force coming from the fake. He didn't even bother to converse with it. Could be an illusion, a creature that had taken on his form or whatever, he just needed the sword. Broly closed in on the fake who took in a stance with his hands stretched out to the side and to the ground, one foot in front of the other. The fake waited for Broly to approach. Of course, Broly instantly knew what stance that was, it was his. He somewhat suspected what the trial would be after seeing himself with the sword. Broly closed in with a punch and before the fake could attack, he pummeled it into the ground. The fake was just too slow for him and was quickly beaten up into a pulp. It didn't take long until the fake couldn't move anymore. Broly just took the sword off the fake's back. The moment he did, the fake crumbled like sand and dispersed in the wind. Broly suddenly felt the movement of his body becoming easier. To be more precise, it was the life force inside his body that didn't feel any pressure anymore. He could move it around and burn it like he used to, but he wasn't able to use his key or his magic. After coming to that realization, he somewhat was able to guess what would be coming next. Just like before he felt himself being tucked away as his surroundings changed once again. This time it was a lush forest that was brimming with life force. He landed once again at the outskirts of a floating island and the outside of the island was the same as before with never-ending blue sky with a cloud here and there. Broly jumped up and tried the previous method of searching for his target, but because the forest was too dense, he couldn't find anything. He put the sword on his back and went through the thicket. He walked for a few minutes and abruptly raised his arm to the side of his face. Bang. With a heavy impact, Broly slid across the ground until he crashed into a tree. He looked at the spot from where he got attacked from, but he couldn't see anything. He stopped moving and focused on his senses. As soon as he heard something, he struck in that direction, but he didn't hit anything. With a sudden sense of danger, Broly tilted his head to the side. Blood splashed as his cheek was cut open. Even though he was hit in the face, he still couldn't see, smell or hear anyone near him. Only his sense of danger was able to defend against the strikes. He couldn't ponder about it as the next strike soon followed. Just in a short amount of time he had several cuts and bruises on his body. But his eyes were filled with confidence as if he wasn't bombarded with attacks. He even smiled as he defended. For several weeks he couldn't move around naturally like he was used to but now his body was partly his own again. He was savoring in the moment as he adapted to his regained strength. His senses were at their peak and slowly but surely, he was able to instantly react to things that headed his way. After a hundred exchange between the two, he was able to remain unscathed by the attacks. He knew that his opponent was most likely another fake version of himself that had created an illusion through magic, but from what he noticed was the fact that he still attacked in close combat. Since magic attacks aren't as destructive as key attacks and would cause close to no damage, it made sense for the fake to depend on something else to wound him. Considering the force behind the attacks and that it didn't use ranged attacks, it was almost certain that the fake used life force to boost its body. After having gathered enough information, he prepared for a counterattack. 
he suddenly felt something heading for the back of his head. He ducked and without moving his legs, his body moved diagonal behind him. With a horizontal slash, he felt his fingernails tear through something. The empty air he struck just now became distorted and a second later showed another fake Broly who held its neck. Blood was spurting through its fingers. The fake didn't seem disturbed by it. Rather, it had a fierce expression on his face. Broly ignored the expression and directly followed up with a frontal kick. With overlapping cracking sounds, the fake was sent flying. The fake crashed into a tree and before it could do anything, Broly had already caught up. Broly pierced through the fake's eye hole, ending its life instantly. Like before, he felt the pressure lighten up. His magic power was able to flow freely through his body once again. He picked up the sword and once more was sucked away. He landed on a flat white surface. The background hadn't changed. This square-shaped island was tiny compared to the others. It was only one kilometer in size. Broly immediately saw another fake that was staring at him. Broly could feel that this would be somewhat troublesome. The fake didn't hide its tremendous amount of key. The fake smirked at Broly and without effort, its body shape changed. It grew to 2.5 meters with steel-like muscles that revealed its tremendous amount of strength with a single glance. His green glowing hair reached his buttocks. Lightning arc circuited around the fake. Broly frowned slightly as he felt the strength coming from the fake. Although he had finished the previous fights with relatively ease, he wasn't so sure now. In the first fight, he used his soul to overwhelm his opponent, and in the second fight, he used his life force to fight his opponent to warm up. But now he would have to go all out, and even then, he wasn't sure of victory, which was puzzling. If he would have fought himself before he defeated the statues and absorbed the energy inside that black spot, it might have been true that Legendary Super Saiyan 3 would be around the same strength with him, maybe even stronger, but now he should be able to win by a margin. However, what seemed to be true was that they were around the same level. Another problem was that the fake was able to use key. Both on the same level of strength, but one could use range attacks and the other couldn't. It was clear which one had the advantage. Broly dashed towards the fake and punched out. The fake seemed to mirror Broly and did the same. Their punches met and with a shockwave the ground beneath them gave in. Broly was surprised that the fake would contend with him in close combat. But he wouldn't say no to that. He struck out with his other hand which was blocked by another punch of the fake. Both of them pushed against the other with no clear winner. They had the same idea and struck out with their knee, but the fake was taller than Broly by a bit and had a higher range. The fake leaned backwards to create some distance while trying to knee its opponent. Broly quickly struck out with his elbow to block it. The two turned into a blur and exchanged hundreds of strikes in just a few seconds. The ground was devastated by the shockwaves the two created when they clashed, but there was no sign in sight of who would win. In the midst of the battle, Broly had unconsciously tried to use his vision of truth and, unexpectedly, saw some kind of light threads coming from the middle of the center. A crystal blue sword was hovering there like it was spectating the battle. Only now did he realize that the fake didn't wield a sword. Broly didn't think as he just headed for the sword and completely ignored the fake. The fake followed him but since they were on the same level, it couldn't catch up with him. Broly instantly arrived at the sword and grabbed it. He swung around and sliced through the upper half of the fake's head. The sword seemed to pulsate after the fake was killed. The next moment, Broly opened his eyes and he was back inside the hall but this time two giant black swords hovered to his sides. Additionally, Broly wielded a two meter long curved crystal blue sword. It resembled a Kriegsmesser from his past life and was pulsating with power. Broly was delighted as he felt the power of his key return to his body. Now he was back to having full control of his body. He had closed his eyes as he relished in the feeling, completely ignoring the two guards. The guards had their widened eyes fixed on the sword Broly held. Shock was written on their face. This is, the blue guard spoke out for the first time with a trembling voice. Broly opened his eyes and looked at the sword he was holding and felt the power inside of it. The swords that were hovering on his side suddenly shrunk in size until they became blinking floating lights. Saluta's sword, however, first trembled slightly before it did the same as the other swords. Without a warning, the sword lights shot towards Broly's sword and merged with it on different places. On embedded itself at the bottom of the hilt, one into the crossguard and the last merged with the blade of the sword. The former crystal sword changed to a black that seemed to absorb every bit of light that touches it. Only the edge of the blade was shimmering in a blue light. The energy of the sword was somewhat masked. Only Broly who held it was still feeling the full tremendous power it hid. He felt like he was holding a bomb that could go off any second, but he still felt no threat coming from it like it was meant for him. 
it has finally appeared. The Red Guard blurted out and brought Broly's out of his daze. Broly shot him a glance. Is this sword something special? Broly felt that it held significant more power than Saluta's sword. It was on a completely different level. It is the first sword which has been wielded by the king. There had been several imitations that tried to recreate its power, but no sword came close to it. After the king fell, his sword shattered, and the pieces turned into swords of their own. The one you are holding is the foundation of the first sword. Even if all the other swords fused, it would only be on the same level. Is that why Salutis wanted me on this island? Broly mumbled as he inspected the sword. Salutis wanted you on this island? Broly looked at the Red Guard. Yeah, he is the reason I was able to get here in the first place. Broly suddenly came to a realization. Can you try to convert a second time? Broly asked the Red Guard, who now seemed willing to answer some questions. Indeed, you can. A sword grants you one attempt to convert. So if you absorb another sword, you can try again. How can one acquire another sword? You can't enter the Island of Trials a second time, but you can get another sword by killing its owner in a duel. The rights of the sword will automatically transfer to you after the owner is dead. HM? But I did kill Salutis. Why did you tell me to get another one from the Island of Trials? Was he not dead? I cut him in half and burned his remains. I even used my vision of truth to confirm it numerous times that the corpse was indeed his. Yes, you did, but it wasn't a duel. You can challenge another sword wielder if you wield one yourself. If you kill one without challenging him first, it is not considered a duel. So, even though you killed him, you didn't get the rights to his sword. But I did absorb it just now. Indeed, usually a swordsman can only absorb another sword if he has the rights for it. However, what you wield is the foundation of the first sword, its essence. It doesn't need the rights to one of its own sword pieces to absorb it. So, Salutis wanted to challenge me to get another sword piece? Probably. After all, if you had acquired a normal sword piece, your powers wouldn't have returned. They wouldn't have? Even without my powers, I would still be stronger than him after absorbing those black spots of the statues outside. Broly felt that his victory was assured even without his key, magic, or life force. The guards looked at each other after hearing what he said. They had a bitter smile on their face. The statues outside were strong and weren't meant to be beaten. A normal challenger would have all his power suppressed with only his soul to work with. One was meant to avoid fighting them and escape inside. There wasn't an actual need to clash with them. Of course, it was difficult to escape their attacks, but to actual beat them and steal their source of power, that wasn't supposed to happen. That was also why they had attacked them the moment he stepped inside. They wanted to test and vent on him a bit, but unexpectedly, he was able to completely defend against them. Broly asked them what went wrong with Salutis' conversion. Usually they weren't supposed to give information, but it seemed because Broly wielded the first sword, they made an exception. After answering that question, the guards urged him to convert now. They told him what to do once the process of converting began. Only after their explanation about Salutis' failure and the process of conversion did he realize what this conversion meant for him. He didn't ask more questions, but went to the sheath on the pedestal. He took the sword and sheathed it. The moment he did, a portal opened in the wall behind the throne. Broly went ahead and directly jumped into it. The moment he did, he felt like he was submerged in something. In the distance, he saw a blue light. Broly wanted to move towards it, but he couldn't. Broly tried to use his energy to move towards it, but to no avail. Only after using his soul was he able to crawl his way towards it. After what felt like days, he reached the blue light. It looked like a shimmering pearl. Broly didn't hesitate and grabbed it. The moment he did, intense pain ran through his body. The pain spread towards his magic and life force core and to his soul itself. He knew that this was the conversion they were speaking of, so once the pain had spread, he circulated the techniques to absorb the crystals all at the same time. As soon as he started, he could feel how his life force and magic core slowly broke into pieces and headed for his soul. The cores he got from the crystals were slowly dissolving and turned into energy that nurtured his soul. It was an excruciating process. Every piece of core that was broken off made Broly tremble in pain, but he knew that he had to preserve. If he lost his conscious, he would fail the conversion and the consequence would be dire, not something he would be able to manage. Salutis had failed to convert as he had a flawed technique of absorption. Although he was able to create cores as well, in the midst of the conversion a tiny flaw made itself known and instead of fusing his energy with his soul, his soul fused with his life force. After coming to that realization, he must have stopped the conversion before more damage was inflicted.
Broly figured that was why he wanted to fight with him in the first place. His life force technique was flawed and with the fight with Broly, he would be able to figure out what the problem was. Afterwards, he would have challenged Broly after Broly got a sword and try the conversion once more. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to escape Broly's hands and died before his plan took on fruitions. Now Broly only needed to preserve through the pain of the conversion. If he succeeded, his soul would be the source of his magic and life force power and not his body. With his soul gaining the power of these energies, even if he was fatally wounded, it would barely inflict his strength. Even if he died, his power would be enough to ignore the laws of the afterlife. Time passed for Broly as the energies turned into strength of his soul. An unknown amount of time passed with Broly converting his energies into his soul. The process carried unbearable pain with it. After being reborn, he was confronted with pain that not only targeted his body but his very soul. With life pain had followed it. After struggling for years, he wouldn't flinch if his hand was cut open. Even if his body was impaled by metal rods, he would still be able to stand proudly. His pain tolerance wasn't something most beings in the universe could compare to. It was ironic as he had one of the toughest bodies in existence. But even with that kind of tough body, he had suffered tremendously. The main perpetrator was himself as he crushed every bone in his body at least a few times whilst training. This method of training didn't only raise his pain tolerance, but his willpower as pushed himself further and further in the next session. His body even adapted to the pain slightly and wasn't at the least bit satisfied after the training room didn't have any effect on him anymore. Now he had to preserve through excruciating pain in order to complete the conversion and it became more unbearable as time went on. Salutus had stopped at the beginning after he realized that something went wrong. Even if his plan succeeded to absorb another sword of a suppressed Broly and got another shot at the conversion, he would have failed miserably. Broly didn't think during the conversion as the pain didn't allow for different thoughts to arise. He could only endure and count the seconds as the process continued on. He couldn't be sure if it were mere minutes, hours, days or even years have passed since he had started. For him it felt like an eternity, but he knew that was only his perception of time. He gritted his teeth as he felt like the skin was being slowly peeled off his body while being cooked alive. If he failed to stay conscious and discontinued to circulate according to the absorption techniques, he would fail the conversion. His energy cores would be in pieces and his soul would be incomplete. He wouldn't be able to strengthen his soul or his energies afterwards. If that happened, his only hope would be advancing with his key, but he knew that would slow him down on his path to supremacy significantly. With only his key, he would still be a lot stronger than most, but to gain the ability to contend against gods would again take a lot of time. Of course, even a half-converted soul would grant him a significant boost in strength, but Broly didn't want strength for the price of cutting off potential in the future. Not to advance in the departments of magic, life force or his soul would be a price too high for him to pay. However, he needed to see this conversion through. He not only needed to find a way to get off this island with the others, but with the guard's explanation he knew that this was the path to the absolute peak. This would be the first step to not only reach the level of gods, but to even surpass Zeno himself. No matter what, he had to preserve. Time was ticking away while the other exhaustions waited for his return. Broly didn't know how much time has passed, but he realized that the pain had lessened for some time. He inspected his body and noticed that the cores had vanished completely, only the residual energy in the body was left. The life force and the magic power that had once reached every corner of his body was now being sucked into his soul. His body needed to be void of these energies and only then would the process be complete. In comparison to dissolving his cores, to absorb this remaining energy was child's play. It didn't take him long to finally complete the process. After the energies were absorbed, the pain vanished. After a moment of silence, his soul seemed to have a reaction. The previous still soul was suddenly leaking tremendous amount of power that filled the void that the energies had left behind. While that happened, Broly was blinded by a bright light. He covered his eyes until the light vanished again. He didn't realize it immediately, but he was sitting on the throne in the hall. The guards were now kneeling in front of him. They didn't raise their head but had lowered them, not daring to look straight at Broly. The black Kriegsmesser with the blue edge was unsheathed and hovered right in front of Broly with the black sheath floating next to it. Broly opened his palm and the sword sheathed itself again and placed itself in Broly's hand. Broly closed the eyes and felt the power of the sword. Although he had held it before, he was now more sensitive towards its power. After he had returned to the hall, his mind was being flooded with information. 
It was mostly information about the civilization called Para and how it had waged war since it was able to travel to other multiverses. They had conquered not only their multiverse but had stretched out their hands to the neighboring multiverse. But they soon realized that their power was severely weakened in other multiverses. They had studied the creature that inhabited these multiverses and searched what gave them their strength. They created temples with statues that mimicked their powers and after a long time they were able to create living imitations of the most powerful beings that had inhabited their respective universe. After creating life, they realized that the imitations were somehow able to retain warped memories of their real counterparts. These creatures had rebelled and in a grand war devastated Para's world. Of course, they didn't have the strength to overturn the civilization and were quickly eradicated. Afterwards, the civilization decided that if they couldn't create creatures to fight for them then they had to change themselves, so their power would become multiversal. Some of the higher-ups were stubborn and kept on creating new creatures since they didn't want to throw away their work of millenniums. They said that was the only way and it would be impossible to not be suppressed in foreign multiverses. The forest that was surrounding the abyss was one of that projects. It allowed the development of different creatures, but it had a suppressing element to normal citizens of Para. Indeed, it was an incredible difficult task to make one's strength multiversal, but after eons and eons of waging war with different multiverses and experimenting with different methods, they had finished a conversion process that would grant their souls the fundamental and multiversal source of existence, the power of different energies. The crystals played a fundamental role as they would make the receiver's soul compatible with these energies. However, the process was too difficult to complete. In ancient times, only a few tens of the billions inhabitants of Para were able to succeed. After tuning the process countless times, they retracted their troops in order to accumulate strength, but destiny wasn't good to them. Several overlords had attacked them with their armies. A long battle that ripped apart multiverses came to be and only stopped after this mighty civilization had fallen. Broly opened his eyes after he took in this information. Herditus, even this island was only a fraction of what Para used to be. They had tried to save themselves by using the crystals as a defense and to hide in the enemy's universes, but ultimately, they were found and eradicated. Perhaps only this island is left of the once glorious civilization. Broly had to say that he found all this extremely interesting, but one thing had caught his attention in the memories. It seemed like one of the overlords that had attacked Para was Zeno or his predecessor if something like that exists for the king of all, but what was important was the fact that one sword piece was kept saved by Zeno. There was also the question on why they were able to absorb these crystals. According to the information, it was only meant for Paris. As he inspected his sword deep in thoughts, he suddenly saw something on the back of his hand. He turned his palm over and saw a golden triangle that was drawn into his skin like a tattoo. It was strange, but he instinctively knew how to use this tattoo. He stood up from the throne and placed his sword on his back. How long did the process take? Broly asked the kneeling guards. About 10 seconds. Broly was stunned, but he only shook his head and smiled bitterly. He clenched his fist slightly, making the golden triangle shimmer. In the next moment, Broly was teleported outside of the temple. The giant statues were reconstructed and guarded the temple once again. He stood in front of the Exaugeans, who looked shocked at the sudden appearance of Broly. After a moment of silence, their faces lit up not only because of his return, but to feel the oppressive aura coming out of Broly. For the last few weeks, they didn't feel any pressure from Broly. Even if he used his soul, it wasn't as domineering as his normal transformations through Ki. Part of the reason was that Ki was a mostly destructive energy. There are some healing capacities to it, but it is mostly used to destroy, making it rather oppressive. Of course, during the time where Broly was being suppressed, he still showed his power from time to time, but they knew that wasn't something Broly could hold up indefinitely. Now that Broly had returned with full power, they had relaxed instantly. The other Super Saiyans and Zhongya knew that this temple had to be something of importance to the whole island. So after seeing him return unscathed, they knew that he prevailed through the challenges of the temple. They were now waiting for his confirmation on what he saw and if they were able to go back to their universe. We are going to leave this place, Broly shouted out with a majestic voice, stunning the Exaugeans for a moment before they shouted out its excitement. The S-Fighter were surprised as well. Broly had always did things according to his will and he did it with a domineering and kingly attitude. This time, however, it felt different. It was like his word held ethereal and absolute power. Broly turned around and clenched his fist before everyone present was enveloped by a warm feeling. In the next moment, they had vanished from the spot. After showing his back, they realized that the sword on his back had disappeared. Beforehand, there was Salutus' giant sword that couldn't be overseen. Now, however, it had vanished. 
That was at least the case for the normal elites, for the super scions. They were somewhat able to perceive that a sword was still sheathed on his back. If they tried to look straight at it, they wouldn't be able to see it. It was only a feeling that a sharp blade was still being carried on his back. They weren't sure if it was real or just an illusion. They didn't think about it anymore as they had quickly arrived in the throne hall. Broly told the other elites to wait here and then teleported with the S-Fighters to a room that seemed to be made out of glass. However, they weren't watching the surroundings, but they were somewhat able to perceive the whole island. Broly was here for the first time as well, so he was as astonished as the others. They saw the vast island in its whole magnificence. The forest that surrounded the abyss was far bigger than they had imagined. They were rather fortunate that they were placed rather close to the abyss and temple. It was inconceivable vaster than they previously estimated. They noticed many mighty creatures that could give an ascended super scion a run for their money. Broly now knew how they would find their way back. In this room, they couldn't only perceive the island, but also search for another multiverse to target. Normal beings and even Broly's brain couldn't comprehend the area between the multiverse yet. So they had to rely on this room to navigate. If he was strong enough, he might be able to handle the complex dimension that was holding together the very existence, but that wasn't something Broly could do just yet. Fortunately, they weren't trying to find another multiverse, so Broly wouldn't even need to rely on this room to navigate to their home. The reason why he had brought the others here was another one. Broly had thought about how he could use the resources he now had gained with this island. He wouldn't only use it for traveling between the universe. That would be too wasteful. After weeks of remaining on this island, he saw the value of the environment. He would use it to train more super scions. There wouldn't be a better place that had the right danger level to let an elite scion transcend their normal scion limits. He had only spent a couple of weeks in here, but the number of super scions had already doubled. They were even able to look underground into the caves. They discussed several places for training purposes and quickly developed a rough training draft from normal scions to ascended super scions. They concluded that they would send the ones who made considerable contribution in developing Broly's kingdom through the missions here. Broly also told Aze about how he thought he should adapt his training regime so the Scions could integrate their instincts more instead of just a tactical fighting style. This island wouldn't only be their headquarters for when they want to move to other universes, but it will be their farm for producing Super Scions. The more he thought about the prospects of this island, the happier he got. After talking about the future training, a bit more, Broly decided that it was time to get back home. They navigated through the space and time cracks between the universes and traveled to a spot that had a rather thin barrier to enter. The reason he didn't want to just blatantly enter their universe was that they would most likely be discovered by Beerus or Wiss. He would only move close to the thin barrier and then enter with their own bodies. The colorful nebula that surrounded the island was in fact something produced by the island itself. It was part of it. It was responsible for making the island invisible for outsiders. It also used to create illusions to keep unwanted guests outside if they were too close to the island. Unfortunately, it was damaged during the attacks of the overlords. Probably only Zeno would be able to locate the island if he searched for it. But Broly didn't have any intention to get Zeno's attention for now. Broly had already thought about the perfect place that would hide the island and keep a safe path towards it. The island was smoothly flying through space and time cracks without disturbing them even in the slightest. Even the ones on the island itself didn't notice that they were moving. As they headed towards their universe, Broly inspected the tattoo on the back of his hand. A hollow golden triangle like it looked like before it turned into a tattoo. What was different, however, were the colors that filled the triangle. At the bottom left it was colored red like blood. The bottom right was bluish like the ocean and the top was filled with a healthy vibrant green. Red for life force, blue for magic and green for his soul power. It wasn't that this tattoo was his source of strength, it was more like it used the three energies to create a unique imprint, like an identification of some sorts. While they were heading for Broly's pick destination, he took some time to feel the changes inside his body. He could use life force and his magic like before. Additionally, it was supplemented with his soul making its affects far more potent. It was basically only a relocation of his power from his body into his soul, making it usable in every multiverse in existence. Of course, he also realized its drawbacks, which was the consumption of his soul through these energies. Broly, however, didn't worry too much about the consumption. One of the best parts of the conversion was probably that through the additional energies, his soul was much more resilient than before. Previously, if he used his soul to his limits, he would accidentally injure it, but now he could exhaust its power and only need to recover the used-up energy with a short rest. While Broly finished with his assessment of his situation, 
they had arrived at their destination. The others also realized where Broly chose to hide the island. Indeed, it was a place that was almost completely hidden from the gods and they were familiar with it. Even if they were discovered, they could use the excuse that they wanted to visit their home. The location Broly chose was Perdidus. To be precise, it was the space and time tunnel between Perdidus and the normal universe. He now didn't have to worry about the tunnel collapsing as he could brute force another way if it did. They wouldn't need to worry about being eternally trapped on Perdidus. There was only one thing left to guarantee that the island would be easily accessible for them. Broly looked ahead and saw a giant amount of life force swimming through the cracks of space and time. If he hadn't seen it now, he might have forgotten about it. When he had first entered the rift to traverse to the normal universe, he had seen a massive amount of life force in a nebula that appeared in the rift. It had disappeared as fast as it appeared. Broly now only needed to kill whatever lurked in the space and time cracks. Without hesitation, he speeded towards the massive life force. Like in the past, it was shrouded in a nebula of some sorts. He dashed into the nebula and after flying for a few seconds at full throttle, he arrived. He saw gigantic whale-like creatures with what seemed like a cross-shaped halo above each of them. Most of them were a kilometer in size, but the biggest in the group was very different to the others, it was another life form. It was a few tens of kilometers big and had six long tentacles with spiky ends. Its many teeth were long and intimidating. It was a mixture of an eastern dragon mixed with sea dinosaur and other monster of horror. It looked like it that was out to devour anything that came near it. A destroyer of worlds. It was the very embodiment of a deep underwater monster and this leviathan strength wasn't something to trifle with, at least for normal beings. Broly watched as the whales released a fog that was added to the nebula around them. Of course, Broly had already noticed the magic particles in the nebula and directly avoided whatever effects it had by making a thin but impenetrable barrier around himself. The whales opened their mouths from time to time as they sucked in the energy between the space cracks. Be it magic, life force, or key, they absorbed it all. The Leviathan, however, took it one step further as it directly devoured space and time cracks, only leaving behind a scar. Broly knew that these cracks had enormous amount of energy inside it as it needed to pierce through space and time itself. That's why it was rather common that they were created when stars or planets exploded. The high energy rips a tear inside the fabric of the universe and through the remaining energy it is able to stay open. This was probably also the reason why the Leviathan was still around as Perdidus was surrounded by chaotic space that had a lot of remaining energy which wasn't surprising as the whole planet was originally from another universe. Either way, the space cracks would eventually cease to exist. The problem now was that the energy would have returned to the universe but now it was being devoured by a monster. Broly wasn't out to save the universe's energy by any means, but the people he would send to the island would be in danger if this thing decided to come around for a quick snack. He couldn't contain himself any longer and was about to head into a killing spree, but before he could do so a large shadow rushed through the nebula. Broly raised an eyebrow as he heard the deep roar coming out of a hungry beast that has seen its prey. In the next second Broly saw Kalan rush out of the nebula and dive right at one of the whales. He directly pierced into its flesh with his claws and ripped big pieces of meat out of it. Sometimes he would roast a piece of meat with a fire breath or directly wolf it down. Did no one feed him? After this thought ran through his mind, he realized that he didn't feed him after he had imprisoned him. There were ways to replenish one's nutritions with energy, but did this childlike dragon know how to do that? Probably not. It was only reasonable that Kalan would be starved and go on a rampage after seeing these fatty whales. Kalan's action, of course, had been noticed by the Leviathan, and it wasn't happy that the whales that hid its presence was being killed. Broly had felt the same otherworldly aura that he felt coming from the lion Aslan and the human-like guardian golems. Broly could tell that the Leviathan was another creation of Para, and it was a strong one at that. He could also sense a form of intelligence, not on the level that he could negotiate with it, but on the level that it knew to not rashly enter the universe and hide between the cracks. It was impressive enough that it kept these whales around him as they felt like normal creature of this universe and wouldn't necessarily get any attention by the gods and angles. It had to be said that Para was an ingenious civilization. The normal beasts that didn't had strong capabilities or were offspring of the imitations like Kalan. They always felt like they belonged to the universe they resided in. This was also why Broly only felt the aura coming from the strongest and original imitations. Broly had some confidence that no one besides Zeno would be able to detect the differences of these creatures. His confidence wasn't something that came out of thin air. He had a vision coming from a multiversal civilization that far surpassed that of normal individuals. In fact, he still didn't know why he could see the way he did. 
There wasn't a clue about it in the information he absorbed, and the guards didn't have an idea either. The Leviathan struck at Kalan with one of its tentacles at incredible speed considering its size. Kalan saw this and prepared an attack. His mouth was overflowing with black flames. Before the tentacle reached Kalan, he fired his scorching hot breath. The moment the black flame touched the tentacle, the fire expanded rapidly, covering a huge ground almost instantaneously. It quickly devoured the tip of the tentacle and left nothing behind in its stead. The Leviathan roared out in agony that shook the space around them. Broly even felt like his inner organs were slightly trembling because of the roar. If he was slightly affected the same couldn't be said about Kalan. He was convulsing and his black face even looked pale, although it was only Broly's imagination. Broly quickly shielded Kalan from the roar's effects. As soon as Kalan was better he directly dug into the whale that Kalan had killed and ate its flesh. Kalan became energized by the whale's meat and surprisingly even looked stronger and taller than before. Broly didn't bother with Kalan, feast anymore as he had turned his attention towards the leviathan that was warily staring at him. He could see the hesitation in its eyes. Broly couldn't help but grin as he now had the opportunity to test his strength but more importantly that of the sword. His key suddenly flooded outside, creating a storm that swept numerous whales inside its whirl. His body grew to 2.5 meters and his hair grew longer. He had turned into his third legendary state, however, unlike before his power wasn't only oppressive, but it now had an ethereal feel to it. He was using his key coupled with his improved soul power. Broly unsheathed his sword form his back and the aura of absolute power assaulted everyone's senses. He looked at the Leviathan while raising his sword. Whales were uncontrollably flung around Broly and seemingly calling out to the Leviathan. The Leviathan had sensed the danger coming from Broly and fear could be seen in its horrific eyes. Panicked and started to charge its attack. Its whole skeleton got visible for outsiders to see as it began to glow in a blue electrical light. The Leviathan shot out a beam of purely destructive force that devastated everything in its path. Some unlucky whales were caught inside the attack and were directly disintegrated. Broly calmly observed the situation. His hand flashed as it slashed downwards. The attack suddenly split in half, opening a clear view towards the Leviathan. The Leviathan froze and due to its grand size, it took a while until one was able to see that the Leviathan was heavily bleeding in a line that divided this humongous being in two. Broly didn't bother with the Leviathan anymore as he looked at the triangle on the back of his palm. The three sections that filled the triangle were glowing slightly with the red section being the brightest. As he wondered what this might suggest, he felt his body getting stronger with a pure life force being supplied. He instantly knew what just happened as he looked at the split leviathan that was withering away at a visible speed. With his vision of truth, he saw that some of the dissipating life force, magic and soul was being absorbed by the sword and into the tattoo. Much was lost in the process, but every bit was additional strength to which he wouldn't say no to. Broly was ecstatic as he knew that with this sword, he could erase a being almost completely and absorb it into his own strength. After killing the Leviathan Broly took the whales with him. He told Kalan to make them his subordinate. After a few weeks, he may be able to command them and place them between the island and the rift for a safe passage that the elites would need to traverse. He discussed some things with the others and experimented with his newly gained advantages before he entered back inside his universe. He figured out that the tattoo was actually invisible to the others and the sword seemed to have a similar effect, even though it wasn't as perfect. Broly thought about how he could take the sword with him without leaking its presence to others. After the thought arose, the sword disappeared in a flash. He felt the tattoo tickle slightly, so he looked at it and saw a mini version of his sword inside the triangle right in the middle. It was covered by the three colors and Broly guessed that it was being covered by the energies inside his body. After confirming with the others that nothing different could be felt from him, they took the elites and once again returned to their universe. They traveled through the rift and returned to the normal universe without a problem. After re-entering their universe, they gathered together and before they knew it, they appeared in the throne room on Exausia. After teleporting back home, they told the elites to get some rest. The last few weeks were exhausting for them. Broly was more accustomed to it as he could spend months in meditations without rest. This little adventure wasn't bad in hindsight. The only constant threat Broly felt on that island was the unknown and the possible scheme Salutis had. But in the end, it turned out even if Salutis had any schemes, he wouldn't be able to see them through as he was as dead as one could be. He had fused his soul with his body and with his body destroyed, there was no possibility for him to come back without the use of the Super Dragon Balls. 
Broly still only wanted to get to his bed and sleep for a couple of days. The pain he had to endure were burdening to say the least. Broly stepped outside the castle with the others. He saw a figure on top of the highest skyscraper around watching over the city. It seemed like Des hadn't relaxed either since they went to hunt the assassins. The S-Fighters quickly flew towards him. The moment he saw them his face lit up and quickly rushed to greet them. Des hugged Aaliyah and the others and asked them a couple of times if they were okay before he let them go. His reaction wasn't surprising as they had intended to go into one decisive battle to eradicate them. But they hadn't returned after a few weeks which made the general populace uneasy. Many speculated if they had lost against the assassins. But this theory was quickly dismissed as no assassin came back to Exausia to finish them off. In fact, after a few days since Broly and company had left, news of the destruction of this organization was made known and spread like a wildfire. There was a rumor that the headquarters was destroyed and now the roaming assassins in the branches had to go into hiding. After one person took revenge on an assassin and was fine after a couple of days, many laid their eyes on the branches and the roaming assassins. Mostly emperors of galaxies that had suffered under this organization's hand quickly went wild as they hunted down every assassin in their area. They conquered the branches and found many riches that would advance their abilities to another level. News of the found resources leaked out and many emperors that hadn't any conflicts with the assassins started to take action as well. This once fearful behemoth was being wiped out from the surface of the universe in a matter of days. Of course, the average person didn't notice anything about the destruction or its aftermath of these assassins. They only noticed that more people were moving around in haste with greedy eyes. The times for the knowledgeable that wanted a slice of this cake were in for a chaotic time, but risk and rewards went hand in hand, so the participants in this fight for resources kept growing. It was like a universal agreement between all the knowledgeable and powerhouses that they would uproot this organization once and for all. All over the universe movement could be seen. Not only the tyrannical emperors wanted to participate, but the righteous organization as well. Even the galactic patrol went out in the name of justice and started attacking them. Truthfully, the righteous factions were even wilder in their pursuit for these assassins. They made the most noise and it didn't take long before even the most ignorant faction knew of what was going on in the past weeks. After 18 days, however, something changed. As time went on the emperors that hadn't deeply rooted resentment with them began to be more subtle with their actions. Felt like they were gathering their strength. Many seemed to make alliances with other emperors around their territory and started to form bigger and stronger forces. They recruited more soldiers and made an effort to strengthen their troops. Even the righteous factions began to back away after taking their peace and started to do everything to heighten their combat capabilities. Rumor has it that the Kais themselves had ordered them to do so. It seemed like the whole universe was preparing for a war. The atmosphere on every planet that did interplanetary trade noticed the gloomy atmosphere but only the higher-ups knew why they reacted the way they did. After Exausia had appeared on the Universal stage and boldly invaded other galaxies to hunt down the Emperor, Cooler, many powerhouses shook their head. They didn't believe that a force that just invaded another galaxy would survive for long. Their invasion act wasn't only a clear provocation for the Emperors but for the Righteous Factions as well. It wouldn't take long before the invaded galaxy struck back with full might while the neighbors would just watch. In fact some would even step in and help. It was an unspoken rule which they broke and now had to bear the consequences even if they had allied with the local righteous faction. At least that was what they thought. The next days of news shook most emperors to their core. Not only had they invaded the other galaxy, but their king started to blatantly destroy planet after planet. His reason was an attempt to take his life, which was approved by many, but the conflict grew even further. Exausia's king, Broly, destroyed base after base of the conspirer Emperor Mamba. However, what was truly shocking was the fact that King Broly clashed with Mamba and three other emperors of that galaxy head-on and killed each of them. This news sent shivers down the spines of most emperors. Afterwards, King Broly sent his forces allied with the Galactic Patrol to conquer some of the planets that were left under the dead emperor's control. From then on, many knew that Exausia would establish themselves into a force that ruled a galaxy group. The unspoken rule of not invading other galaxy was only able to deter normal emperors, but who would care about that if one was truly strong? Those that conquered their own galaxy completely and were capable of extending their hands outwards were called true emperors. In the universe there were only a couple of these true emperors that solely ruled a galaxy. Even rarer were those that had ruled a galaxy group but none of them exceeded the number of ruled galaxies by 10. It was too risky for them to continue to expand as there were still other strong individuals in this universe and so the power stabilized into the current balance. Now Exausia had presented themselves and it was only a matter of time until King Broly would be declared to be in their ranks. 
For that reason, some had sent spies to Exausia to get information about their development. It would be truthful to say that Exausia had garnered the attention of all powerhouses in the universe. Many were relived after hearing about their overall strength. Their average was impressive, but they had less elites than most other true emperors. In fact, only the so-called super science would be something to be worthy of mentioning. The true emperor's focus on Exausia lessened quite a bit as they didn't think Exausia would be able to threaten them and would eventually now their place in this universe. Otherwise, they would forcefully put them there. They could already estimate the peak that this faction would grow to. It was inevitable that they conquered another galaxy and most thought that they would stop at three galaxies, but their impression of this force had rapidly changed. With their spies, they were made aware that one of King Broly's wife was assassinated by none other than Reap. Many were even more elated about this fact. When they heard that Broly would go out to fight this organization with his elites, they were sure that Exausia would be history after this incident. A few other true emperors had thought about invading and enslaving the Exausians, but another incident had caught their eyes, the downfall of the assassin organization. They quickly changed their attention and tried to gobble up the remaining forces of the branches. They didn't even consider that King Broly was responsible for their downfall. It was a known fact that Salutis was one of the strongest individuals in the entire universe, not something the average true emperor could contend with. King Broly was strong, but from what their intelligence could gather, he wasn't that strong. But someone with a contact to the Kais had leaked the fact that King Broly was very likely to be the culprit of the downfall. The North Kai had paid close attention to Broly's action ever since his past invasions, and he witnessed Broly's tremendous key when he found his wife. The North Kai told them about his capabilities, and it was much higher than they first had thought. Now even the true emperors began to become uneasy and nervous of this monster called Broly. They were somewhat guessing that Exausia's pursuit of Cooler was just a ruse to invade other galaxies, but with Akai confirming this, they knew that King Broly had no intention of staying low. A deadly storm would soon sweep across this universe. A gloomy unease was suspended throughout the whole universe. Many emperors and true emperors in power were gathering their forces and prepared for an incoming war. Their eyes focused entirely on Exausia's actions, afraid that they were the next ones targeted. After they got the news that Broly and his elite troop had returned and scathed, they became even more wary of offending them in any way. It was true that the forces of Exausia only stretched out to the Milky Way and its neighbor the Andromeda Galaxy, but it was undeniable that King Broly, on his own, was a force to be reckoned with. He had ended Salutis and everything that he had built in the last few hundred years. Broly ended this man's whole career because Salutis had dared to lay a finger on one of Broly's wives. Obviously, they were only afraid of King Broly and maybe the other higher-ups that were always at Broly's side, but no matter how strong he and the other seven were, no one thought that Exausia would be able to conquer the universe and the reasons for that were simple. The one that was truly stronger than the true emperors and able to instill fear was Broly himself. Because of that, they felt that their position was still somewhat secure. There were always ambitious people that wanted to be rulers and the present emperors would hardly voluntarily give their position and wealth to Broly only because he was stronger than them. He was only one man, albeit strong, he wouldn't be able to cause a downfall to alliances that had influences in numerous galaxies. Even if he attacked one emperor, couldn't the others just target his remaining forces and kill Exausia's weaker troops one by one? With the limited amount they know Broly had, he would only be able to stabilize eight galaxies in total and even that was a stretch. Broly would be able to place one strong warrior in one galaxy to govern, considering that these were also capable of ruling, Exausia could indeed establish an empire that enveloped eight galaxies. Expanding further than that was highly unlikely, of course, that would only be true in case that no other super scion appeared in their ranks. Even now they heard about other super scions on a small planet called Earth. Fortunately, they seemed to be hostile towards King Broly, however, the fact that they would never join his ranks could be doubted. There was a real possibility that more super scions would appear in the future. For this reason, a network between the emperors and the true emperors was being established in order to plan to dwindle down Broly's force as much as they could. If they could kill the other scions before they grew in strength, they would only have to hide from Broly, but they weren't concerned in that regard. The universe was vast and needed a long time to be traversed. If they had enough time to hide, even with his ability to teleport, he wouldn't be able to find them. If they started an attack with enough people, there was no way for Broly to hunt down every single one of them. The possibility of casualties in the ranks of emperors were high, but every one of them were optimistic that it wouldn't be them. Of course, they didn't know about his ability to control other people and read the minds of even strong warriors. If they knew, maybe they would think twice about antagonizing him, however, with ignorance many resolved themselves to nip this potential threat in the bud. 
They even requested the righteous factions that they had hostility with to join them. Although the righteous factions were wary of King Broly, his actions weren't unjustifiably and could be said to have made justice a service. His actions were extreme at times but all the force Broly had targeted were generally tyrannical emperors or assassins, not something the righteous ones would stick their heads out for. Besides they had a reputation to hold up and couldn't just attack someone that was mostly known as a savior of many. All kinds of reasons made them apprehensive of showing hostility towards Exausia. Indeed, they feared that Exausia would go out of their control once they gathered enough strength, but if King Broly never intended to attack the innocent and righteous ones then wouldn't attacking and antagonizing him now make them potential targets as well? Even if they killed everyone except for Broly, would he leave them be? Obviously not, he killed several emperors because they tried to assassinate him and after he suffered, he took on the most powerful organization in the entire universe and won. It was clear that he was someone who would take revenge no matter what. How long would they need to hide for? What would happen to new criminal scum that arose when they were absent? Why should they help their enemies if only those emperors were being targeted? After getting their thoughts in order and calm their fear, the righteous factions publicly declared to not intervene with Broly's actions, if they were justifiable. Even if his actions weren't justifiable and somewhat extreme, they would probably turn a blind eye towards it. After getting this response the emperors were outraged and insulted them as fools who couldn't see the full picture. Of course, there were some other emperors that didn't even consider to be hostile and personally flew towards Broly to declare their subservience. They thought that they could save their skin if they served Broly's order. Some were deeply ashamed that after all those years they would have to bow their head. But they were clear on the situation ahead. Those were the ones that resided close to the Milky Way and would be targeted next if King Broly wanted to expand his influence. Subservience would be their only way to not be killed by the righteous exaustions. While the higher ups of this universe were in emotional distress, Broly laid down in his bed with his wives lying next to him. After returning, he had immediately thrown himself into bed with his wives and didn't come out of his room for the next couple of days. He was relaxing after the high intensity battles he had fought in the last few weeks. There were some things he had done leisurely which would be helpful for the future as well. As he went through the information of Para's history and the island once again, he found some things that would prove useful to preserve the loyalty of the future scions that would enter. This ancient civilization had some profound understanding of the soul and had something called soul contracts, very similar to what Broly did with Cooler, but instead of controlling them it would show if malicious thoughts towards Broly arose. There was also something else which disturbed him greatly that was only mentioned briefly, as this information was only meant for citizens of Para. For days after he had returned, he finally got out and headed for the docking station of Exausia. This station was only for the VIPs. He saw a gigantic ship landing and open up their door. A staircase extended to the ground and several figures walked out. The other S-Fighters had also sensed their arrival and came to greet them as well. Zinjo, the City Lord, Blitz, Yanari, Vara, Violet, Atrog, all kinds of familiar faces greeted the S-Fighters. Zongya rushed to the City Lord, and they hugged each other for quite some time. The Hera race didn't have many people left that survived, but the City Lord did his best to locate the roaming clansmen and bring them back. The reunion between the former rivals was warm and hearty. Laughter filled the plaza. Taro happily buried Vara in kisses. He wasn't able to see his girlfriend for some time, so he was thrilled that she would now live here. Broly quickly led them into a restaurant called Hell that was near the castle. It had excellent food from Earth and was probably Broly's favorite in the whole city. Due to the king's endorsement, it was popular, to say the least. Broly obviously had a permanent room in case he wanted to dine there. He led his friends inside and a feast was quickly prepared for them. The races of Perdidus had long chosen to ally themselves with the Scions, who were now called Exaustions. The arrival of Zinjo and the other Myrmidons was already planned for a few months now, but it was delayed for quite some time as they had to pick up the other races. There were many strong bandits, and their engines of the other races seemed to have been damaged in a fight with them. Good thing was that the Myrmidons were strong fellows, especially Zinjo was a formidable force. If he wanted to, he could probably become an emperor or even a true emperor, comparable to a high-level ascended super scion. Blitz and Yenari were powerful as well. They weren't chosen to be trained under the city lord without rhyme and reason. Most of them even began to lead their races. 
This was especially true for the powerful prodigy Zinjo. No one dared to disregard him anymore, and he held a high reputation amongst his race. The planets for each race were already prepared for their arrival. They had terraformed the individual planet so each race was able to move in any time. They were extremely moved with how Broly greeted them and the unbelievable help he provided them. They had to spend most of their time in their ship or stranded on a harsh planet or searching for one of their kind. Now they would be able to settle down and create a home. They had heard about Broly's famous reputation of the general populace and knew that this would bring him some trouble. He already told them long ago that he wanted to conquer the entire universe, and they were determined to be part of his grand mission. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.